Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen, amen, namaste. Oath or affirmation, announcements by the speaker. Honorable members, I have received communication from Dr. Rudal Munilal, MP, member for Urupuch East, and Mr. Arnold Ram, MP, member for Karani Central, who have requested leave of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the members seek is granted. Bills brought from the Senate. Petition. Petition lodged by the member for Tobago West on behalf of the Trinidad and Tobago Netball Association, seeking to amend the Trinidad and Tobago Netball Association Incorporation Act 1979 by a private bill in order to change the name of the organization to Netball Trinidad and Tobago. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the member for Tobago West, I beg to present a petition on behalf of the Trinidad and Tobago Netball Association. I move that the clerk be allowed to read the petition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is this agreed? Proceed. The Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. To the Honorable Speaker and members of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in Parliament Assembly. The humble petition of the members of the Trinidad and Tobago Netball Association of Jean Pair Complex, Rice and Road, Port of Spain, here and after referred to as the Netball Association in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, respectfully showed. One, that the Netball Association was incorporated on the eighth day of August. 1979 via an Act of Parliament entitled the Trinidad and Tobago Netball Association Incorporation Act 1979. That the Netball Association is governed by a constitution which provides for an executive to administer its general affairs. Three, that the aims and objectives of the Netball Association are to foster, regulate, and control the sport of netball here and under the International Netball Federation of Netball Association System and to promote friendly tournaments at national and international level. Four, that your petitioners are desirous of amending the name of the Netball Association to Netball Trinidad and Tobago by a private bill so that it may A, promote friendly tournaments at the national level, B, rebrand with an effort to gain new and younger interest, C, market brand and merchandise, B, D, sorry, do all such acts, deeds, and matters, and things, and to enter into and make agreements as unnecessary or conducive to the welfare of netball. Where, five, wherefore your petitioners humbly pray that this honorable house will be pleased to take these premises into consideration and grant leave to the petitioners to proceed with the introduction of a private bill for the amendment of the Trinidad and Tobago Netball Association and Corporation Act 1979 to change the name of the organization to Netball Trinidad and Tobago in order that they may effectively pursue and achieve the objectives outlined. And your petitioners in duty bound will ever pray, dated this 21st day of February 2022, signed by Sharian Blackburn, President, signed by Corinne David, Secretary. Honorable members, the question is, that the petitioners be granted leave to proceed. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Leave is granted.
papers. The Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Public Transport Service Corporation for the year ended 30th of September 2018. I beg to move that this paper be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. Honorable members, the question is that paper one be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The aye have it. The Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following paper, paper number two. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Public Administration to the first report of the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs on an inquiry into the ease of doing business in Trinidad and Tobago, first session 2020-2021, 12th Parliament. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Attorney General. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Attorney General, I have the honor to lay the following papers. Paper number three, the Family Proceedings Amendment number two, Rules 2022. Paper number four, the Criminal Procedure Amendment Rules 2022. Paper number five, the Civil Proceedings Amendment number two, Rules 2022. And paper number six, the Children Court Amendment Rules 2022. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister in the office of the Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers, numbers 7 to 11, the annual reports on the Freedom of, the In of Information Act, Chapter 2202 for the years 2009, 2010, 2016, 2017, and 2018. Questions on notice? Questions for oral answer. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are 25 questions for oral answer and we will be answering 24. We are asking for a two week deferral for question number 128. There are no questions for written response. Member for Karini East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 112 to the Minister of Works and Transport. Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the bridge at Hercules Trace Ravinsav falls under the purview of the Kuva. Tabaki Talpa Regional Corporation and not the Ministry of Works and Transport. However, the Ministry of Works and Transport, as usual, is willing to provide the corporation with any technical assistance that may be required. To date, I am informed that no assistance have been uh, no assistance have been asked for by the corporation. Th Thank you, Minister. Will the Minister indicate if a Bailey Bridge can be used to restore this water crossing? For the villagers in Robinson. Uh, remember, I think from the, res the response that supplemental doesn't arise. Member for Shagonas East. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Question number 113 to the Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Minister of Social Development and Family Services. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Social Development and Family Services, the Ministry has not received a formal request from the Supermarkets Association of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to this matter and has indicated that it is currently finalizing a proposal for the consideration of the ministry and that proposal is to come from the supermarkets association in the meantime the ministry is how is actively engaged in building its digital systems 
which include modernized payment mechanisms to better serve its clients and key stakeholders, with particular focus on facilitating cashless transactions for the unbanked. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Member for Tabakee. Question number, thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 114 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the return of our Forms 1 to 6 students to face-to-face -to -face school instruction is indeed critical for student success in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Though synchronous online delivery of the curriculum was no longer mandatory for some students, asynchronous online instruction continued as required for all students. To this end, Madam Speaker, schools were mandated to prepare and disseminate content, lessons, and assignments for students who are either rostered to be at home or for revision. Learning activities for all subject areas for both the primary and secondary schools curricula were made available via the Ministry's School Learning Management System, and online workshops were conducted for technical vocational teachers and tech ed teachers, and platforms were developed for teachers to collaborate on strategies for delivery of curriculum material for use in in-person instructional learning, assignments, and assessment packages to distribute for students' use at home. Additional, additionally, Madam Speaker, the Ministry con continues to provide instruction to students via its dedicated television stations with approximately 263 lessons that are broadcast to students. The Ministry has engaged DigiData for the ICT upgrade of 134 secondary schools towards school-wide internet area access for educational technology integration, and that process is ongoing. The Ministry procured 10,000 MiFi devices and distributed the same to both students and teachers as well as schools. And as such, Madam Speaker, the Ministry continues to ensure that all of our students have, as far as possible, equitable access to synchronous as well as asynchronous instruction. I believe somebody's device, and I'd ask the person if they could leave the chamber and take that device off, please. Well, I, I would ask the marshal to confiscate that device since it has no owner. Okay, member for Tabakit. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 115 to the Minister of Education. <laughs> okay, so could we have some order and, and continue with the business of the people? Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. The Ministry of Education has in place a fully established and operational monitoring and evaluation system for schools that is implemented through the School Supervision, Curriculum, Curriculum and Planning, and Student Support Services Division. Each school has an assigned line supervisor whose major function is to monitor, evaluate, and guide administrators in school operations, inclusive of timetabling and rostering of classes and teachers. School supervisors visit schools individually or in teams to assess school operations utilizing a standardized school-based management assessment tool. In addition, curriculum officers have developed tools to assess the performance of teachers and through the implementation of clinical supervision, they visit schools and discuss strategies with heads of department to maintain or improve student and teacher performance as necessary. In addition, heads of department and teachers would have received extensive training in the implementation of clinical supervision and utilizing reporting instruments which are monitored and evaluated by the relevant curriculum officers. Guidance officers and school social workers are also available to guide students in transitioning back to in-person instruction. Subject and form teachers utilize the referral system for students who are exhibiting psychosocial learning or transitioning challenges. They too, Madam Speaker, utilize well-developed assessment instruments and intervention strategies. Moreover, Madam Speaker, each district has a district leadership team which comprises members of the three divisions. They are mandated to meet on a weekly basis to discuss issues such as school management, school performance, and student performance with an aim to develop remedial and intervention strategies which have to be developed as a team and implemented for schools in need. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Member for Damaki. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. This is a supplemental. Um, given the work that is being done in m &E, are there any reports that can be made available to the public so that we could see the work of the evaluation team? Madam Speaker, it would depend on what reports are, what specific information is being requested or required. So what I'm asking is that there's a monitoring evaluation system. So are there any reports that can be made available to the public from this team? So, but I, I believe the, the question was answered. It, the minister said it depends on what reports. So maybe if you want to ask a supplemental, maybe you should identify. I will allow that. But this, I will allow the same question repeatedly. So reports on the performance of schools with the rotation of classes, reports like that. Madam Speaker, once again, it would depend on what are you speaking about when you speak to performance. There's attendance, there's student performance on diagnostic testing, there's what is so, it would have to be specific as to what you are looking for and that data could be supplied. Madam Speaker, so all aspects, is there any overall report on performance? Okay, so member, I, I, I think from the first two supplemental um, answers to the first two supplemental questions. I get the sense that your question is too general. So if you wish to ask a third supplemental question, which you're entitled to, uh, I think it should be a different question if I'm going to allow it. Next question would get me to closer to the report. Okay, so <laughs> member for Tabakit, question 116. Yes, um, question 116 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the development of a subject syllabus is based upon key competencies, concepts, and core knowledge suitable for a particular developmental level. Whereas, a curriculum is a guide for teachers and educational institutions on the expected student learning outcomes for a particular age group and level. As such, Madam Speaker, educators focus on the skills, concepts, and competency development applicable to the age and class of the child rather than simply the percentage of the syllabus that was completed. To this end, Hesbo Department, with the support of the curriculum division, would have reviewed the various curricula and identified key skills, concepts, and content to be covered that would provide the student with sufficient capability to move to the next level. Therefore, Madam Speaker, the question is not whether or not the students and teachers can complete a particular curriculum, but whether the key learning outcomes have been achieved. In fact, the approach to curriculum delivery that focuses on the student competency, concept, and skill acquisition is a more excellent approach to teaching and learning than simply concentrating on the percentage coverage of the syllabus. As such, Madam Speaker, while no adjustment to the curricula is necessary at this time, teachers have been provided with the necessary support from the curriculum division to ensure that the key learning outcomes at each level have been achieved. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, has the ministry taken on board the, co the concerns of parents and students in the CSEC classes about the inability to complete the curriculum in preparation for the CSEC exams this year? Minister. Thank you. Madam Speaker, the concerns that come forward are not unusual for any particular year. And so I have, with, um, within the Ministry of Education, no formal concern coming forward from any of the associations or any school that is lodged at the ministry at this time. Member for Maruga Tableland. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question 91 to the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I thank the Honorable Member for the question. I can confirm that in September 2021, the Ministry did indeed receive a report of a complaint, collapse bridge on Edward Trace Bartier Maruga. I can also confirm that immediately on the 14th of September 2021, the engineering division did pay a site visit, did the preliminary assessment. We have since confirmed that the bridge is in fact located on what is the old Petrotrin estate, and therefore it is outside the jurisdiction of the ministry itself. I have, on receiving this particular matter, asked for some coordination with the um, heritage and other entities that are in Petrotrin to see how the entity with responsibility can deliver the solution. And of course, I will continue to be in progress and conversation with you about it. Member for Maruga Tableland. 
Supplementary, Madam Speaker. Um, Minister, given that the incident would have taken place 206 days ago, could we have like a timeline or do you have any um, perceived timeline that something materialized for the farmers that use this bridge? Minister. If the Honorable Member wants to be precise, since 1990, we passed the Municipal Corporations Act. And since the 90s, the issue of vesting of lands has become a priority. In carrying out the work of my predecessor, the Honorable Kazim Hussein, a lot of work was done to identify the vesting of assets. And as a team moving ahead with the Ministry of Agriculture, we'll be able to do what other people have not done before us as we combine our efforts together. Member for Baruga Sibalan. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move on to question 92 to the Minister of Works and Transport. Minister of Works and Transport. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Naparuma Mayaro Road has been prioritized for work in this fiscal year under the Pure Road Rehabilitation Program. The rehabilitation work will be carried out on the stretch of road in Tableland between LP 533 and LP 40, 540. Hindustan Estate Road falls under the purview of the Princess Tong Regional Corporation and not the Ministry of Works and Transport. However, the Ministry of Works and Transport is willing to provide the corporation with any technical assistance that may be required. And the Frederick Road is a secondary road which runs off Naji Road. The road has a low average daily traffic and is in poor condition. Localized rehabilitation work is expected to be undertaken in June 2022, utilizing in-house resources of the Ministry of Works and Transport. I thank you. Member for Point of Pair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 96 to the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, during the period January 1st, 2021 to January 1st, 2022, six illegal quarries and individuals engaged in illegal quarrying were identified by law enforcement authorities. One of those illegal quarries, the action being taken there was actually terminated because of course there is always difficulty that when they go to act, persons are not on the quarry site. Member for point up here. Follow up question. Minister, um, when you had first taken over as Minister of Energy, you said that illegal quarrying was one of your priorities. Could you state, based on question, on answer to B, if there are any things in the pipeline to address the illegal quarrying? Minister. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, the answer is yes. I would not want to get into the operational side of it. It has to be a combination between the Ministry of Energy as well as law enforcement. And we are going to be engaging in some activity directly related to tackling this scourge that is illegal quarrying. Member for Point Appear. Just a follow up, Minister, do you have a quantity of, of, of the illegal cost of the illegal quarry into the country? And I'm not going to allow that as a supplemental question based on the question asked and the answers given. Do you have another question? Okay, member for point up here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 97 to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The government does not have a fixed policy with respect to the privatization of banking, rum manufacturing, and port operations. And each such matter case basis as the need requires and as the circumstances dictate. The divestment and or investment initiatives undertaken by the government form part of the rationalization of the state sector to boost economic efficiency, improve resource allocation, and ensure wide public participation in the ownership of commercial enterprises. These initiatives involve several strategies, including divestment, acquisition, restructuring, mergers, and liquidation of entities. As part of its broad policy, the government will retain or acquire equity in the state entities 
where such ownership is integral to the achievement of policy objectives for the sector in which the entity is located. Broadly speaking, the government will concentrate on providing facilitatory mechanisms, including the removal of constraints to investment in commercial activity and the establishment of the appropriate institutional, regulatory, and incentive frameworks. However, in facilitating such an appropriate microeconomic environment, there will be instances where state participation in commercial enterprise is necessary or may become necessary, especially where such participation is strategic in the national interest or where the private sector is not willing to take the risk in the absence of the state's direct participation. With regard to banking, in the 2022 budget presentation, in furtherance of the government's policy to facilitate the widest possible public participation in the divestment of state assets, the Minister of Finance announced the intention of the government to make an additional public offering of 10,869,565 ordinary shares in first citizens in order to raise approximately $550 million for budgetary support. With respect to RUM, in July 2018, government acquired 61,677 and 11 shares, representing 29.9% of the shares in Angostura Holdings Limited, in partial recovery of the debt owed by CL Financial, Colonial Life, and Clico Investment Bank. It should be noted that the ownership status of Angostura is complicated, with claims and counterclaims currently engaging the attention of the liquidator, Clico, and the court as to the true ownership of various blocks of Angostura shares. It should also be noted that in order to preserve the value of government shares in Republic Bank, Angostura, and TGU, among others, for the generations to come, the National Investment Fund holding company was incorporated in 2018 and was made a close-end fund to hold and monetize assets transferred by government. NIF issued an initial public offering of a suite of bonds ranging from five to 20 years. These bonds are supported by the equity assets transferred to NIF and dividends from the equity investments in five companies are used to service the bonds. NIF has successfully made good on all of its interest payments to bondholders to date and is an outstanding example of this government's policy to preserve state assets for the good of the wider population. In terms of the port, in 2021, the government announced its intention to adopt a landlord model public-private partnership to improve the efficiency of the operations of the port authority. As a result, the government through the port authority invited expressions of interest from investors with experience in port investments, development and operations, shipping, logistics and cruise operations, thereby encouraging and creating a competitive environment for potential new agreements to be created. Government is seeking to position the Port of Port of Spain as a major transshipment and logistics hub, inclusive of the added value cargo handling activities at the Caricom Wharfs and the Port of Scarborough, as well as a potential opportunity of becoming a destination port for cruise shipping in the region. The government's objective in inviting private participation in the port is to establish a more competitive and financially sustainable port system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, based on question, the first question, on the FCB shares divestment, when, when would that come to, the, to market? We are targeting the middle of the year, June, July. Um, on the port operations, when do you see that also being finalized? Cannot give a definitive answer on that. That is under the control of a committee being managed by the Minister of Public Administration and including the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Works and Transport, and other stakeholders. I would suggest you pose that question on notice. Member Fanafari. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 103 to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security.
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the issue which delayed the resolution of this matter was the determination of the authority of the Commissioner of Police to amend the terms and conditions of employment for Special Reserve Police Officers. Since this authority <coughs> was not found in contemporary records, after thorough research, Madam Speaker, reference to such authority was recently traced back to a decision of cabinet in 1977. 45 years ago. Accordingly, the required funding will be released to the TTPS within the next month. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Naparima. Question number 107 to the Minister of Health. Of Health. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. From the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, since March 2020, the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago remains cognizant of the expected mental health fallout. In this regard, the following plans were implemented specifically for COVID-19 pandemic and health workers. One, setting up of a mental health and psychosocial support technical working group who developed and implemented a mental health care action plan for the treatment of care of persons who tested positive for COVID-19, who were in isolation and in quarantine, and our dedicated frontline healthcare workers. Two, the ongoing use of virtual mental health sessions for patients within the parallel healthcare system throughout the pandemic. Three, the continued access to mental health care services for healthcare workers through the employee assistance program and existing services provided by the RHA's multidisciplinary mental health team. Four, the continued use of the network of mental health services offered at our public health institutions for healthcare workers and our citizens, including the use of psychiatric outpatient clinics, namely the child guidance clinics at San Fernando, Port of Spain, and Scarborough, and the children and adolescents living with mental health clinic at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex. Five, the establishment of, a stress, of stress clinics at the North Central Regional Health Authority, and six, the priority treatment for staff at the mental health wellness clinics. Further, for our entire population, the Ministry of Health has developed a digital directory of crisis and emergency mental health and psychosocial services under Find Care TT, with over 30 entities, which has been published and widely utilized to ensure easy access to mental health services. Also, the implementation plan for the National Mental Health Policy anticipates and provides for further increases in mental health needs through the creation of a community mental health team approach and the incorporation of mental health into the primary healthcare system. It is envisaged, Madam Speaker, that the above changes will result in a wider range of mental health services being provided at the community level and will make those services more accessible to persons who need them, including persons whose mental health challenges were triggered or exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Naparima. Question number 108 to the Minister of National Security. Minister of National Security. Thank you yet again, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, according to information received from the Commission of Police, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service does not have a specific policy regarding members of the public taking photographs or video recordings of police officers whilst in the execution of their duty. While there is neither a law nor a policy which prevents citizens from taking photographs or video recordings of police officers 
In those circumstances, citizens are advised that recordings should be done at a safe distance between the parties involved so as not to obstruct officers in the execution of their work. Obstruction of a police officer is a criminal and chargeable offense as detailed in section 59 of the Police Service Act chapter 1501. And it states, I quote, a person who assaults, obstructs, or resists a police officer in the execution of his duty or aids or incites another person to so assault, obstruct, or resist a police officer or a person assisting the police officer in the execution of his duty is liable on summary conviction to a fine of $10,000 and to imprisonment for two years. Additionally, it is to be noted that while there are no laws preventing citizens from photographing and or recording police officers on duty, the pursuance of certain intrusive conduct can amount to harassment, which is also a chargeable offense under the Offenses Against the Persons Act, Chapter 1108. Section 30 of that act provides for the purpose, and, and I quote, for the purpose of this section, harassment of a person includes alarming the person or causing the person distress by engagement in a course of conduct, such as following, making video recordings of, stopping or accosting the person, acting in, or two, acting in any other way that could reasonably be expected to alarm or cause the person distress. It also, and I continue, a course of conduct involves conduct of the kind referred to in paragraph A, carried out on at least two occasions. A person who pursues a course of conduct which amongst the harassment of another and which he knows or ought reasonably to know amongst the harassment of the other person is guilty of an offense and liable on summary conviction the fine of $2,000 and imprisonment for six months. In light of the aforesaid, Madam Speaker, citizens should be mindful that while photographing and or recording a police officer on duty is not per se unlawful or illegal, members of the public would be well advised to note the relevant provisions of the Police Service Act and the Offenses Against the Persons Act, both of which I quoted, Madam Speaker, and both of which provide that continuously doing so in a manner described above can amount to harassment and lead to arrest and charges accordingly. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member Fidaparima. Did the Minister agree to undertake an educational program so that police officers and members of the public, including journalists, will be clear as to their rights with respect to the taking of photographs while the police officers are operating? The member is proceeding on the assumption that the members of the media and the members of the public and most of all police officers are as shallow as a thimble. I am sure, Madam Speaker, these laws have been on the books a very long time and many, there have been many prosecutions in terms and therefore the member is presuming that there is no such information or knowledge in the public domain and I don't think he's correct. Member for Tabakit. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Question number 117 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, with respect to in-person classes and additional resources. The Student Support Services Division, they work in tandem with the, the rest of the Curriculum Division as well as the Student Supervision Division. And so they have um, received resources and assistance from those two divisions to be able to deal with student absenteeism. In addition to that, Madam Speaker, we have met with the Ministry of National Security, the Community Police, and the Ministry of Social Development Family Services to deal with adding additional resources from those ministries to assist in dealing with absenteeism. Because the causes of absenteeism, Madam Speaker, once we go down to it, sometimes it is a social issue 
and sometimes we have security issues as well. So we have been working with those two ministries to be able to provide additional resources from outside of the ministry to assist in getting home visits for our students who are absent. Um, we need the community police to assist in those areas and where we have issues of social um, need, then we deal with family services to provide that. Also, what we have gotten from Ministry of Social Development and Family Services will be counseling services for the families because where the school social workers cannot go further, we require that extra assistance. So, Madam Speaker, what has been happening is the infusion of additional resources outside of the ministry in a collaborative fashion to be able to deal specifically with student absenteeism. And we have been getting that cooperation, and so we have been able to get some of our students who are um, having that particular issue back into our classrooms. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the Minister will recall last year we had gotten some significant numbers of persons who had been absent from school. So since the allocation of these additional resources, has the Ministry seen an improvement in the number and will report to the public about the number of student abs absenteeism that we're seeing? Minister. Madam Speaker, we can make such a report available. Um, yes, we have seen in some cases, but it's a dynamic situation. You have some students coming back and you also have some students um, who are not coming back and new students. Above the age of 16, compulsory um, school attendance is not required. So that is also a part of the issue. When students reach that age, then they are not um, required to attend school. So you have some issues of being able to get them back into the classroom at that time. However, yes, we have seen some improvements. Member for Tabak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 118, Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Many thanks, Madam Speaker. The policy of the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is to administer vaccines to our population that are approved by the World Health Organization. On January 21, 2022, the WHO's Strategic Advisory Group of Experts, SAGE, on immunization granted approval for the use of vaccines for children between the ages of 5 to 11 years. In light of the above, the Ministry of Health is currently in discussions with Pfizer, Inc. concerning the terms of a suitable agreement for the provision of these vaccines. In the interim, the Government of Spain has offered Trinidad and Tobago a gift of 40,000 Pfizer pediatric vaccines and a vaccination program for children between the ages of 5 to 11 years will commence upon the receipt of these vaccines. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member for Point of I'm sorry, sorry. Member for Karen East. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, um, given what you have just said, why didn't um, the Ministry of Health procure these vaccines pending WHO approval, similar to what was done with the Chinese Sanofarm vaccines? Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, the position of the government is to engage in negotiations. We started negotiations with Pfizer prior to the approval, my friend, and that has been made public. So I don't know what fishing expedition that you are on, and that is the start of the process. So we started this process with Pfizer in 2021, before the vaccines were approved on January 21st, 2022. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Member for Pfizer, Bart. Okay. Minister, in light of your revelation that the vaccines will come from Spain, can you at all give any indication of the time frame expected? Mr. Health. Thank you very much. As I indicated, the vaccination program for these children will commence upon the receipt of those vaccines. We currently have no firm date, but as with all the vaccines coming in, we are working assiduously behind the scenes to acquire these vaccines in the shortest possible space of time. Yes, and, and let's hope that you all encourage children to take the vaccines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, could you give us an idea of the number of vaccines that would be required for this age group, please? The required for this age group. the number of vaccines that were required for the age group 5 to 11? Madam Speaker, the estimate for that age group 
is about 120,000 children, which will mean about 240,000 doses if all children take it. But that is not what we are aiming at. These vaccines have very short expiry dates. Um, the gift from Spain may expire in June of 2022. So we are being uh, realistic in what we could administer in that short time frame. Madam Speaker, Minister, um, given the fact that you said that we need 240,000 vaccines for this age group, what, do you, what are you going to tell the parents that have to send their children to school in April for term three to physical classes and their children are not vaccinated? Okay, so based on the question, the original question asked and the answers thus far, I will not allow that as a supplemental question. Member for Point Pair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 119 to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam President. Speaker. The most recent valuation of the Petrotrin Employees Pension Plan indicates that the aggregate market value of the assets stood at $7,859,000,000. Supplemental member for point of appeal. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Could the Minister stated the most recent valuation? Could he give a specific date of that recent valuation, please? Supplemental member for point of appeal. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Minister, in a statement question, on February 5th, 2020, he stated that there would be a valuation done by June 2020. We are nearly two years. Could, could, could the Minister state what happened to that independent valuation that was due June 2020? Minister. Madam Speaker, as usual, the opposition gets everything wrong. The purpose of that valuation is to determine whether there was a deficit in the plan, and that was done. Supplemental member for point of appeal. So could, um, could the minister state if there's a deficit in the pen Petrosian Pension Fund currently? Minister of Finance. Madam Speaker, dependent on the interest rate used for the actuarial evaluation and the methodology, they're dependent on the interest rate. What I'm seeing is that a 6% return, the plan is in surplus. For those who may know something about actuarial valuations, there are scenarios that are presented by actuaries using an assumed rate of return, an assumed yield. Madam Speaker, as I said, Madam Speaker, for those who are familiar with the valuation of pension plans, actuaries present scenarios based on assumed interest rates. And depending on the interest rate that is finally selected, a plan can be in deficit or in surplus. The indication I have is that when an interest rate of 6% is used, the plan is in surplus. Honorable members, the question time now has expired. In accordance with standing order 2910, the whip has signified that all unanswered questions on the order paper today are to be postponed to the next sitting. Public business, private members' business, motions. I await the member for Coover South and the Minister of Finance before we proceed. Member for Naparim. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Whereas the government 
has been unable to effectively prevent a surge in criminal activity, resulting in rapid increases in murders, robberies, and home invasions. And whereas the government has failed to set and operationalize a forceful and functional crime reduction plan with smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound goals to, to, to curb the growing murder rate. And whereas the government has con consistently ignored and through their incompetence added to the fundamental causes of crime while focusing on punitive measures instead of preventative measures. And whereas the failure to effectively address crime has created social, political, economic, and cultural crises of immeasurable proportions, be it resolved that, that this House reprimand this government for its failure to effectively prevent the surge in criminal activity in our country. <laughs> Madam Speaker, it brings me no pleasure to come today to highlight the complete incompetence of this PNM cockistocracy. I will spell the word for them. I will spell the word for them. K A K I S. T-O-C-R-A-C-Y. It, it means, Madam Speaker, because I'm sure they do not know the, the, the meaning of the word, it means government by the most incompetent among us. Madam Speaker, minister after minister has come and gone during this administration's time in office, each worse than the past, and yet the only people who feel comfortable enough roaming freely throughout our nation from Scarborough to Pinay Dibal. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Pinal Debe. I mean, sorry, I I I I I, I get mixed up. Some P Pinal Debe, the only people rolling roaming freely are criminals. The government will come today and claim that crime has increased, decreased. But they are unable to account for the pervasive feeling of unease felt by the Marish and the parish in Trinidad and Tobago today. Why does no one feel safe if they claim crime stats statistics are down? How reliable are these statistics? Are they being verified by independent third parties? But Madam Speaker, the biggest insult towards the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago occurred last week when the Prime Minister reshuffled his cabinet and failed to remove the worst, most clueless, mo most in uh, incompetent Minister of National Security we have had in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. The Prime Minister must answer to the citizens of this country and state why he saw it fit to keep the present Minister Hines when we are witnessing levels of brutality and blatant disregard for human life from criminals as we have never seen before. In the past two years, there have been four decapitations Fire bombings are on the rise, with two sisters dying in one such arson attack last month. Criminals are abducting citizens from their homes and places of work. Our elderly are being constantly targeted. And as a 73-year-old, I feel particularly vulnerable. Shootings are taking place in the presence of children and our children are being decimated by stray bullets. Numerous execution style killings, bodies being found in trunks of cars, 
Bodies dumped in landfills. Bodies being disposed over cliffs. Our women, our women are specially targeted. Madam Speaker, this is just one month in Trinidad and Tobago. It is shameful, unacceptable, depressing, and infuriating in 2022. We are in a worse position in this country than we have ever been before. Six years they have been in office, and what do they have to show for it? Over 3,000 murders in six years. 15,500 robberies. This is the wild, wild west we're talking about, tombstone territory, where every, every man is good as his jaw in tombstone territory. 11,700 burglaries, 1,200 co-home invasions, and this is data from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. These are the kinds of, 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 of criminal activities that citizens have to put up with on a daily basis. Our issues extend far past simply locking up criminals. Every ministry, from education to social development to sport the agriculture has a role to play in producing an environment that encourages national growth and development with a consequential reduction in criminal activity. Madam Speaker, no wonder. We all know that the ministries of all the ministries are not performing optimally. I, I didn't say so alone. The Vice President of Guyana said so recently. He said Trinidad and Tobago is falling apart. It is known globally, it is known regionally. Under this PNM administration, we have a cockistocracy, a cockistocracy government by the most incompetent among us. Now, if we talk about all of government approach to crime, it means that the Minister of National Security must be able to influence his colleagues, cabinet colleagues, to play their part in reducing crime. But it seems, it seems, in fact, I would say methinks that the member for Love Until West clearly lacks the persuasive skills to influence his ministerial colleagues to play their role in what a former Minister of National Security, Edmund Dillon, said are all of government approach to dealing with crime. I do not think that this minister, and this is part of the problem, is able to, ha to have sway over the finance minister, the education minister, the minister of social development. We need somebody who has respect we have somebody who could command his colleagues to help him and join in this all-of-government approach to dealing with crime. I, and I think the government, must apologize to former Minister of National Security, Edmund Dillon, who always spoke of an all-of-government approach that apparently fell on deaf ears by this cockistocratic government that presents itself as a responsible first world administration. Madam Speaker, the Minister of National Security has failed to acknowledge that it is his responsibility and his duty to ensure that his colleagues cooperate and collaborate with him to address the root cause, causes of crime. The buck stops with him. But what do we have? We have a, a, a plethora of acting appointments. I, we, the acting Commissioner of Police. Uh, we have an acting Commissioner of Prisons. And I could go on and on and on. We have a Hollywood Ministry of National Security. Everybody acting. And, and, and we hear, and I do not have the facts, the papers have said that the, 
the, the, the prison outbreak, one of the prisoners that were caught might be a situation that uh, was a car rented by the, the prison service. And, and there's suggestion that it could have been acting. Hollywood style, big joke, ministry that is not serious. And this minister, this incompetent minister of national security is failing every citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. He has failed the Ministry of National Security and every subdivision under him. And the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has failed the country. Every citizen of and every every citizen and every victim of crime by allowing the Minister of National Security to retain his post. He, he should have been moved. He should have been reallocated. He should have been shifted away, the farther away from the seat of governance, the better. Madam Speaker, I rise on 48.1. Madam Speaker, this is a motion on crime against the government, not a motion against the Minister of national security. Okay, so, Member for Naparima, I will give you a little leeway, but it's a valid point in that, remember, this is not an, a no-confidence motion in the Minister of National Security. Okay? So, please, you have a number of aspects, and while you may say this is part of it, this is not the whole focus of your motion. Okay. Thank you. I'm guided, Madam Speaker. So we, we could ask the question, why is it crime is so pre prevalent and criminals feel that they have a freedom to operate um, with impunity in Trinidad and Tobago? And I, 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 the leadership, the leadership of the, minist of the ministry is critical in solving crime. We cannot discuss the, the abject performance without holding to account those who are responsible for the operationalization of the policies. But I am guided. I am guided. I am guided. Madam Speaker, when we do performance appraisals, we look at outputs or results-based markers, not activity markers. And, and before somebody jumps up, I want to say that we have spent in paragraph two, we talk about smart goals. And I'm speaking specifically about the non-existence of smart goals in the operationalization of the ministry by Minister Hines. Madam Speaker, we do not talk about activity. I worked for years in, uh, in 1981 in, in, in Trintock. And every bo my, my boss at the time was, he's still alive, Mr. Howard, Howard, I'll remember his name shortly. He used to uh, hold monthly, weekly appraisals, Hugh Howard, monthly appraisals based on targets, not based on activities. You couldn't go to him and say, I, I had a magazine, I, we, we had six for the month, we did this, we did that, we did the other. He said... I do not want to hear what you did. I want to hear the results of what you did. And that is why we, first world countries, operate on the principle of smart goals. So you do not give a 10-point crime plan, which was a glorified list of empty promises. In management, we must understand the fundamental difference between activity, otherwise called process-based planning, an outputs-based management approach. There are thousands of students, of, of persons, citizens in Trinidad who have done bachelors of management, MBAs, and they know that in the 21st century, no minister could come and talk, give a list of things that they're doing. It, they must, at some stage, talk about the results of the list that they are presenting. In their response today, I am sure those opposite will provide a list of activities that they're implementing to deal with crime. I, the, the world is not interested in a list. The world is interested in the results of your activity. The, 
they, they, I, and I, I reiterate, lists do not matter. You can well have a well-developed list of activities with no results. Listing activities is an anti-diluvian approach to management. The failed 10-point crime plan was merely a list of activities to deal with crime. The first point on that crime plan, Madam Speaker, concerning the process to appoint a police commissioner. But what the government cannot to this day say was what was the output target for that item. Because all they are interested in is presented, we did this, we did that, we're doing this, we're doing, we're buying cars, we're buying this, we're doing that, we're doing the other. No results. That is why we have the anti-gang legislation, which, which is included in crime, and, and, and it, we are told that it will solve crime. We know the names of everybody. We know, we know everything about gangs, but at the end of the day, no measurable difference with the Anti-Gang Act. Madam Speaker, would the appointment of a, com a commissioner of police, which is point one in their 10-point crime plan, lead to a 20% reduction in home invasion in three years? A smart goal would have said that, and I challenge this minister, he cannot, he will not come this afternoon and tell us he will reduce murder by 10%. He cannot say that. He will tell us all the million and thousand and one ineffective things that a cacistocratic government will lay before an unsuspecting society and a parliament. You will read about targets like this, Madam Speaker, and I've done my research. You'll read about targets in Singapore. Sorry, I would have said Barbados, but I am advised. Singapore, I will stick with Singapore. In Singapore, mi ministers are paid a flat salary with bonuses based on smart performance targets, Madam Speaker. So that if we have a minister like Minister Hines, if he reduced the murders by 10%, for example, in his first year, his bonus would probably be 6% of his salary. And that I, I want to make that fundamental pro, uh, point today, that we are missing the boat as a country that is aspiring to first world status when we could resort to lists. If, on the other hand, murders were to, in, were to increase under his watch by 10% or more, he would be flagged in his performance appraisal. If in the following year there were no measurable performance imp improvements, he would be fired. And I want to tell Minister Hines, if you were in Singapore today, you'd be fired. I rise on Standing Order 48.1, and specifically, Madam Speaker, in the context of the hypothesis that this member is even outside his own motion. Again, this is not a substantive motion on the Minister, and I ask for your consideration. So, Member, I have... I've advised you before. I uphold your objection. Okay, and I hope you will abide by the advice. Okay? I will confine my, spirit, my uh, contribution to the SMART goals alone. I wouldn't mention anybody, Madam Speaker, but we, SMART goals are specifically uh, indicated in the motion before us today. Oh? Yes? I have no difficulty with the SMART I have advised you, and I hope you will abide by it. A country like Singapore, goals would be set. Goals would be set for any minister. And if the goals are not met specifically, that minister, whoever he may be, would be fired. So, so when we, what we have in Trinidad is, is, is statements, we have lists, we have 10-point plans. We have uh, indications of what they're going to do. And at the end of the day, we do not know where it will lead us. So let's take for our country. For the month of March, our news headlines read. And I will just give some examples. One, 38-year-old taxi drivers robbed at gunpoint. Car stolen. Two, two men shot during home invasion in Carson Field. 
factory. Gunmen open fire at Valsane Shopping Plaza. Four, man shot and robbed in his own apartment. Five, two children among three robbed tied up in an attempted home invasion in Arima. Six, a 54-year-old man in Wallerfield killed during a home invasion. Seven, 53-year-old sergeant robbed and beaten in home invasions in Gasparillo. 23-year-old construction worker shot while sitting in his truck. This is the month of March we're talking about. Woman robbed of her vehicle in broad daylight. Chopped incident between two people, both hospitalized. One month we're talking about. Madam Speaker, these are just a few. If I read all the headlines on crime under this government, we would be here all day. Is this what the Prime Minister calls good performance, satisfactory performance? The new Attorney General must not come with a suite of legislation, because if we're dealing with crime, legislation is an aspect of dealing with it. He cannot come with a suite of legislation like his predecessor without telling us that if we pass this law, kidnappings per year will be nil. Break-ins will be reduced by 15%. Convictions will increase by 80%. And our recidivism rates will be reduced by 50%. That is what we want. Nothing else here will impress us on this side unless we hear clear targets. So at the end of the year, we can see whether you delivered or not and we can hold you to account. Madam Speaker, even in scripture, you have to detail your results. So when, <laughs> when God asked Peter what you do, and he said, well, who do you say I am? And he said, oh, Peter, God said, I ask you, who do you say I am? I am asking this government, are you reducing the murder rate by 10% in one year? Are you re reducing break-ins by 15%? I do not want to hear about your activities. Instead, they have dropped their bo their, their, their ball with their vaunted list of activities that allow criminals to run free. Now, since, since we have had new leadership in the ministry, we have had an upward trend in crime. Upward trend in crime. Between July 2020, in July 2020, there were 33 murders. One year later, in July 2021, it increased from 33 to 37, an increase in, in murders. Between August, sorry, August 2020, there were 22 murders. Guess what? A year after, that's August 2021, the August just passed here, it increased from 22 to 35, for heaven's sake. In, in, in September, we could go through month by month and see where we are headed in crime. September 2020, there were 23 murders. In September, one year later, 2021, 38. October 2020, 33 murders. October 2021, it moved from 33 to 58. For heaven's sake, for heaven's sake. November, it is worst in November, worst. And there were 24 murders in 2020, 24. In, tw in November 20, 2021, it moved from 24 to 69. 69, where are we going? And that is why people looking on in the region will say things are falling apart. Chinua Chebe would say differently, the center cannot hold. The center cannot hold. In, in December, 27 murders. In December, 2020, 27 murders, 2021, 34. In January, that is uh, the first month for this year, we had 25 murders. 
25, eh? In January 2022, it, it doubled from 25 to 52. Where are we going? And I ain't calling nobody who's responsible for this. I ain't saying that. Somebody will jump up and say it's not about a minister. These are the facts. These are the facts. And facts are stubborn things. They do not go away. So you could laugh. You could pretend the, 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 the performance is dismal. And in a country like Singapore, you will be, you'll be fired. February 21, 27 murders. February 22, 36 murders. Madam Speaker, from April, April, if you want to compare, <laughs> you want to compare murders from the 19, 2021 using TTPS data as well as news reports. April 1920 to February 2021. You want to compare that with April 2021 to February 2022. And, and that is when this minister was appointed. I know it's not about the minister, but I make the point. You, you see, that's the point. You crafted your motion. You crafted your motion, and your motion is about the government and the failure of the government. You crafted it. The government, the government during last year and this year, there have been a 50% 50 per, 50 in, in, increase in murders for a similar period. The government. There has been a 94% increase in fraud offenses by the government year on year. There has been a 47% increase in woundings and shootings by the under this government. There have been a 56% increase in kidnappings under this government. A 41% increase in murders of the elderly. The elderly, nobody is safe. At least 97 larcenies of dwelling houses. 1,072 burglaries and break-ins. This is not Baghdad. This is not Kiev. This is Trinidad and Tobago. 20 business places robbed in a year. And yet, Madam Speaker, yet, Madam Speaker, we are, the government will come and say, we have performed. We are, we are a first world government. Madam Speaker, I say to them, we are a cacistocracy government by the most incompetent among us. This, this government has severely neglected our prison infrastructure and rehabilitative programs. Madam Speaker, we are all shocked by the escape of five convicted prison criminals from the Golden Grove prison through, through dormitories. And they, we are registered where we celebrating that we captured them. <laughs> we celebrating that we captured, escape. We have a low conviction rate. And when we convict them, they jump through the roof, the roof and escape. And we celebrate, champagne, drink. We have captured them. The government has spent 42 mil billion, bi -bi 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 billion on national security, passed law after law, and yet something as simple as upgrading our prisons to ensure convicted criminals serve their punishment, they have been found wanting. The president of the Prison Officers Association, Siren Richard, said, and I quote, those dormitories are in dire need of repairs and have been for some time. The infrastructure, the I say, is dilapidated and ought to be broken down and rebuilt. That is a quote from the Express March 20, uh, 22, 22nd March 2022. He further stated, and I quote, more money is typically spent on transportation than the actual upgrade of security. Member Fanaprina, based on your motion, I stand on standing order 41, based on the text of your motion. Okay? So please get back on track.
think uh, I, I am addressing the area where the, it, it, the, the failure to effectively address crime has created social, political, and their failure to address crime. And in fact, I remember, please proceed and be guided by my ruling. So that we have a situation, we have a situation where crime is out of control and they have failed to address in measurable proportions the situation with crime. I'll give some statistics to terms, in terms of the measure. Trinidad at in measurable proportions. Eh? Trinidad and Tobago, embarrassingly, has a prison population that is per capita higher than 185 countries. I'm giving a measurable in, 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 in the index here. Trinidad has 276 prisoners per 100,000 of population. That is statistical data before us. And if we have more persons in, in prison per capita, it means something, the measurements are not adding up. As my political leader would say, the maths is not matching. Something is not right. When we look at the statistics in this PNM administration, we, 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 the statistics indicate that thousands of our citizens have, are now in jail. They will quote statistics to say that they have arrested, and this is part of the data that is necessary to talk about crime and the performance of crime in Trinidad and Tobago. They would say that they have arrested, given fines, and ticketed thousands, but they will never give a specific target of reducing our prison population by 50% in two years. That is why I will come back in all my talks to the point that what we need is data, measurable targets that we can hold them to account. This government has no imagination, no creativity and expertise to, in, to intervene, to revamp our programs, to aim at reducing recidivism rates, which is, a, which is a measurable information index in the assumptions behind crime. And this is fundamental to the motion that we do not have the data. And wherever we have the data, the government is found wanting. Last year, we had reports of prisoners calling hits from prison. Now, now, that is part of, if we had 50 calls from hits from prison, that is part of the measurable performance of the government. A hit list with 13 prison officers named, that is part of the data that is before us. And if we, we, could, we could not, we could ignore the data and walk away. And, and the country will be left with persistent crime. And all of us, today for me, tomorrow for somebody else. We know it. One of the things we have to face up to truth, however bad it is, and deal with it. If we obfuscate, if we hide, if we don't want to hear it, then we will remain the paria in this region. Madam Speaker, under this country, when you look at the data, pariah, when you look at the data about illegal guns and whatnot, we see, we see endless problems. All right, members, I, I would really like to hear, hear the member, Panapa Rumi. Member, please continue. Yeah. We have, we have seen no need to approach to, to the, 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 the heads of the various ministries and hold them to targets. Hold them to targets. According to the TTPS statistic, there have been 3,671 wounded and shootings since 2016. 3,617 since this government took office. At least 2,200 murders since they came to office in 2015 have been shootings. 75% of murders since since. <laughs> I'm not going there. Where, where is the emphasis on catching persons responsible for, 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 for arming these criminals? Who is bringing in the guns and who is tracking the data for that? 
Madam Speaker, they cried crocodile tears asking for anti-gang legislation, yet and gang activity is increasing. Today is in the Guardian. And, and you see, they do, they, this government does not like to face reality. The Guardian says today, um, the revelation, again, I can't talk about the minister, but again, there's data here and I have to bring it forward. They're saying that r r the MP was trying to find out why despite the anti-gang act, there continues to be escalation in gang violence. The minister ought to come and say, there is not, there is an increase and these are the steps we're taking to reduce it. And I would have said everything is good, but it's clear that they realize that we are stuck in an anti-Diluvian mood, Madam Speaker. The acting commissioner of police, uh, uh, McDonald Jacob, in January this year, said that an average of almost 60% of the murderers every year is linked to gang warfare. Three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah? The minister, in, in, on Wednesday, we were told in this honorable house that, that, uh, that, uh, that the escalation in gang violence is due to the death of a known gang um, leader towards the end of 2021. No problem with that. But why is it always a known gang leader? For heaven's sake, under the anti-gang legislation, it is li illegal to be a gang member. So if you know that he's a known gang member, he should be in jail. Madam Speaker, now I want to make the point. I want to make the point that we have spent in, 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 in our crime fighting strategies, we have spent on crime suppression, the 80% of our money, and 20% on crime prevention and crime rehabilitation. Madam Speaker, in Canada and in other countries, it is the reverse. So do not claim that police clubs are being used to guide our youth away from being wrongly influenced and then give them a total budget of a measly two million for nine police divisions, which, which means 77 police stations. When the SSA receives 287 million, if you don't wanna confront that, cool. I could walk away, cool. But you cannot spend 287 on SSA and spend pennies on, 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 on youth clubs, on the CCC, on my lot, on my part, on 4-H clubs, on national mentorship program under the Ministry of Sport, on the youth apprenticeship program in agriculture and others. This minister should come when he's responding to me and say, I will shift the, the, uh, the, the, the budget allocation from 80% from for crime suppression to for 40% for rehabilitation and, and, and crime prevention. Madam Speaker, we are, we are in trouble. We are in significant trouble. As long as our and 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 as long as our security arms are not prof so e equipped, because the government has failed to effectively address crime, which is part of the motion, if they do not allocate the if they do not allocate the resources, we will be in trouble. The promised state art, the state of art forensic science center is nowhere near completion. Madam Speaker, we have data again, statistics again, 10,000 police officers in Trinidad for a population of 1.4 million. Residential communities, business communities and all constituencies can more than adequately be patrolled and protected day and night. We have 10,000 police officers. With this number, we should be commanding the streets. Toronto, I, I visit Toronto fairly regularly, and they, are, they have 3 million, we have 1.4. They have 5,000 police, we have 10,000. And you can see police in, in Toronto more than in Trinidad. These are the problems, the data is needed However, the motion is worded, data is needed to confront the issue of crime. When, five, data again, data again, Madam Speaker. How could we expect to catch criminals when you call a police station, the response time could be an hour, two hours, or two days? 
global best practices suggest a five-minute response time. I want this. I want. The, uh, the government, when they respond, to tell this country unequivocally what is the new response time for police if you make a call to the police station telling them that there's criminal activity in your house. Unless we answer those questions, you could come with all the lists in the world, it will make no sense, and the country will be suffering from this scourge of crime. The TTPS system needs to move past physical station diaries that are often cannot be found. We have officers that don't have their pocket diaries, diaries on them, so they can't take a report. Up to today, we're not clear. I have seen where police officers have stopped people from taking pho uh, photographs while they're doing uh, 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 um, uh, their, on their work, and the persons were not interfering. We have officers losing pocket diaries. We have station diaries with loose pages. This cannot be 2022. Why are we not fully computerized? Come and tell me that when we talk, when you respond. Our officers across the board need ongoing training in diffusion tactics, a word I just learned today. They, they require improved investigative training to catch criminals with hard proof that cannot be thrown out in the court over trivial issues like incorrect recording you could no want to hear that, and we could continue being a third world country. Uh, or you, you listen to it. Yes, I'm stating it in a, in a, in a, in a way that perhaps um, someone uh, who supports the government may not like to hear. But if you hear it, and if you act on it, all of us will be better off. But if you dismiss it, if you dismiss it, we will continue operating as we are doing free for all. I fear that many of our national security personnel have lost pride and accomplishment they ought to have in keeping the nation and citizens safe. This government has done nothing to improve morale and nothing to improve sense of duty to country to the detriment of the crime situation. Today, a question was answered about, about SRPs, and uh, the SRPs called me and begged, begged, because for, 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 for years they have not been paid what was due to them. We are now told and, and take congratulations for that. We are now being told that they will be paid next month. And they called me and my tech and they told me they're congratulating us. Let us hear, I said it before, the scripture says, let us reason together. Let us treat each other with respect and we could work out a better Trinidad and Tobago. I really want Trinidad to be better than Guyana. I want it to be better than Barbados. I want it to be better than Singapore. I want it. I don't want to run and leave. And you and we have to work together. But cut out the smug nonsense. The smug nonsense. Treat us with respect. And we will work in the interests of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, I know that this government has problems with mathematics and whatnot. But um, it, is, it, is, it is on and on. We need, we need to develop uh, 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 all of government, uh, all of science, a data-driven approach to, 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 to our planning. This government has no plan or vision to make Trinidad safe or secure. Madam Speaker, it's the third month of 2022, and under this government and under this minister, we have had to, this, to date 112 murders. They have no vision, no plan, no way forward. It is happening throughout all ministries. Vice President Jagdo tells us that our country is falling apart. I don't like to hear that. I love my country. I love my country. Madam Speaker, um, with those in mind, I have some questions to the minister. What when he tell us he'll reduce murder rate by 30%? When will he tell us that he'll reduce crime by 40%? When will he tell us that convictions will increase by 60%? When will the minister sit with all arms of the national security and discuss the way forward and how to tackle the crime upsurge? When will he finally discuss an all of government approach and come up with realistic targets? Madam Speaker, I, uh, my other colleagues will, will, will develop areas, legal, and other aspects, educational aspects, how we need to get this thing together. But I, I leave with the point that this government must understand that they do not have knowledge and they do not have it all, and that they must listen, exchange, so that we could produce a better Trinidad and Tobago.
that he, he said it. One minute, please. Yeah. Remember, I really didn't hear. I knew you came back, but I didn't hear. Uh, I, Madam Speaker, I beg to move. Thank you. This motion requires a second. Yeah. Member Fatality. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I second the motion and I reserve my right to speak. Honorable members, the motion being seconded, I shall now propose the question for debate. Be it resolved that this House reprimand this government for its failure to effectively prevent the surge in criminal activity in our country. Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. As I rise to respond to this motion as submitted by the member for Naparima, very early in his presentation, Madam Speaker, he described the government of which I'm a proud part as incompetent. And he described yours truly as Minister of National Security as equally incompetent. But Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, the United National Congress, and he supports the member for Separi as his leader, he will Madam Speaker, he will, he will condemn Vassan Barat. He will condemn the member for Oropuchis, but he will support Separia. And Madam Speaker, the member for Separia as Prime Minister of the government of Trinidad and Tobago selected and had six persons in the Ministry of National Security in five years. If you want to describe something as incompetent and bad pick, is that, and one of Madam them Speaker, was someone, Madam, Madam Speaker. Speaker. 48-1, please. 48-1, I, I. Member for Kuva South. It seems that you intent on delaying us today. I had to wait for you to stop to stand up and rule. So if that is going to be the case, you know, you and I have a certain understanding. You take a little walk and you come back and, and, and you comply. Okay? Let's go ahead. Remember, for um, Love Until West, I'm giving you a little leeway, but remember this motion is about this government. I, I, I was only responding to the allegation that the government is incompetent and so on. Madam Speaker, one of them, as I said, was at the time of his selection, well-known, well-wanted internationally by marshals of other jurisdictions, put him in the cabinet, one of Madam six. Madam Speaker, 48 one again. Madam that, Speaker. This is not about, this is, Madam Speaker, 48 one. The minister is being irrelevant as usual. Okay, so, as I said, a member, this is about this present government, and while I am giving you some leeway to answer some of the things, not everything that is tangential, I'm going to allow you to develop. So please quickly wrap up your point and move on. So to, to quickly wrap up, to quickly wrap up, Chose a senator, chose a former attorney general, both of whom are before the criminal courts today. That is incompetence. Again, they were well known. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the member for Naparima, he spoke about bodies and cars and robberies and murders and break-ins. What is the reality? Those, unfortunately, are not new to Trinidad and Tobago. Those are not unique to our term in government. These crimes have been committed in Trinidad and Tobago from the birth of this nation as a nation state, and most certainly when they were in the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So what is all that about? Nothing new in Trinidad and Tobago. In one weekend in 2011, there were six or seven murders, again. and it led to a state of emergency. Irrelevant again. Irrelevant? 
48 1 madam speaker it's not about 20. and this motion madam okay if everybody wishes to speak at the same time i'll sit down and let's let everybody speak if you all feel that it's going to be productive Remember, or put you aside, can't hear you. Okay? Yes, again, I am allowing you some leeway to answer some of the things, but please let's get on with the motion. Madam Speaker, the member for Naparima described this government as catastrophic. Well, I describe his as kleptocratic. The member spoke as well about acting appointments. I mean, every child should know, and every member of parliament should know. No word was used on your member. No more word was used on your member. Your member used a particular word. This member has responded. Please continue. Every child and every member of parliament should know the question of appointments to the position of deputy commissioner and commissioner of police, commissioner of prisons, is a matter for the police service commission, a matter for the public service commission, a matter for the teaching service commission. So for the member for Naparima to point fingers on this side of the house and talk about acting appointments is disingenuous and ignorant, to say the least. Madam Speaker, let me put that to rest. It is dumb and ignorant. And it is designed, Madam Speaker, to mislead the unwary minds in the society. Those are matters for the service commissions. Has nothing to do with the government or the minister. The motion, Madam Speaker, is based on a false premise. It is designed to please its cheering and reckless friends in other places, Madam Speaker. It is designed to create scandal and discomfort and dis-ease in our society. So let me begin with some statistics, some facts and figures. The member for Naparima told us that the world is interested in results. Let me talk a bit about some results. Madam Speaker, in respect of murders, and this is information gleaned Gleaned, Madam Speaker, from the Crime and Problem Analysis Unit of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, official statistics. In respect of murders, whilst murders increased in 2021, 450 of them, unfortunately, when compared with 2020, which was 399, the statistics still represent a significant decrease in what occurred in the previous in years immediately before that. For example, with 539 murders in 2019 and 516 in 2018. Madam Speaker, so that the data presented, Madam Speaker, shows no indication of any rapid or out-and-out -out increase in murders. Those are the statistics, Madam Speaker. In respect of breakings, similarly, we have seen a significant decrease in the occurrence of breakings and robberies. In 2021, there were 1,510 breakings. Whilst in 2020, there were 1,736. In 2017, Madam Speaker, by way of example, 2,176. In 2018, 2,026. In 2019, 2,217. In 2020, as I said earlier, 1,736. In 2021, 1,510, and to date in 2022, 357. Again, Madam Speaker, the data reflecting that and does not demonstrate any rapid increase 
in break-ins as has been suggested by the member for um, Naparima. In respect of robberies, in 2017 recorded were 2,913. In 2018, 3,246. In 2019, 3,018. In 2020, 2,082. In 2021, 1,868. And to date in 2022, 494. The robberies and the break-ins reported in 2021 represent the lowest number of such reports over the last five years spanning from 2017 to 2021. Those are the facts. And that is why I suggest that the member in his normal, boisterous, annoying way came today on a false premise to create disturbance and discomfort as the UNCs want to do in the national community. In respect of initiatives in response to these, Madam Speaker, the TTPS, and you see this motion is framed to talk about the government, but the member for Naparima knows full well that no minister of government had any powers of arrest or right or power to investigate anything. If I did, I would have locked up plenty of them. But unfortunately, I don't. And I heard the member make a most outrageous comment here today when he was talking about some gang leader. I gave an answer in the Senate on Tuesday, and I said on the information I received from the police, that it was the death of a well-known gang leader that led to some turmoil and some turbulence in the criminal community. And the member for, for Naparima made a most outrageous comment that one is, is a known gang leader. Once you know he should be in jail. Well, if that was so, the benches around him would be half filled. So and I, have, uh, I could back yes, that up. Uh, uh, yes, Member, member, I'd ask you to withdraw that. Uh, withdraw that. Thank you very much. I withdraw that, Madam Speaker. But I'll talk about life sport in a little while with your leave. And I'll talk about white collar crime with your leave. And who among their previous friends in handcuffs today for white collar criminal activity in this country? And who was thrown out of a joint select committee because a police commissioner Madam two years Speaker, ago? Madam Speaker, 48-1. Okay. It is relevant. Okay. So, member, let's, let's get back on track of the motion, please. Obliged. Obliged. Madam Speaker, in respect of the police response to this, and I've already demonstrated that the statistics from the crime and analysis uh, problem, crime and problem analysis unit of the police service has demonstrated that his, his motion is flawed. Insofar as they are responding, the police service designed a strategic plan for the next three years. I had the benefit of listening to it rolled out by the police commissioner and his team just about a month ago at the police academy and came away telling the public that I was impressed with the work the thoughts, the ideas, because I've been around this platform for a very long time, a former police officer myself. And I know uh, it was a solid, well thought out, well organized strategic plan, which is now being rolled out almost to every police officer so everybody could buy in and understand what is involved. And it came complete with an operating plan. Over the last five years, Madam Speaker, spanning the period 2017 to 2021, the police service seized a total of 4,376 illegal firearms. Take them out of the hands of the criminals. In my view, that is not enough. Another arm, the SSA of the National Security, the Intelligence Gathering Agency, told us in one of our regular heads of divisions meeting where we strategize and look at their professional plans in response to this situation, told us that there are about 12,000, they estimate, illegal firearms in this country. Some people think there might even be more. 
So as a consequence, a strategy was developed and Mr. Jacob announced it two weeks ago to engage all arms of national security from fire to police, prison, defense force, everyone including the intelligence agencies, along with the customs and immigration to engage in a national firearm retrieval exercise in this country where it is my hope as minister on behalf of the people of this country that they will retrieve about 6,000 illegal firearms in six months. That's my dream. That's my ambition. And I know if we work hard, these are physical things sitting somewhere, hiding somewhere, we can find them. Meanwhile, we have a very active and robust border security and management program in place. I can tell you now, Madam Speaker, the radar system is now 100% functional, recently made so. And now we can see everything that is happening around our islands. And we are building our capacity to respond to those as we did with the OPVs, which another government destroyed and dismantled, making our defense weaker and allowing more drugs and guns and human trafficking to occur and come into our country and come in shamelessly today to ask us what we're doing about crime. My question to them is what are you doing as parliamentarians to support the legislation that the police and the defense platform require in order to carry out their job? That is my question. Set of hypocrites. Madam Speaker, 48-4. 48-4. You sure as he's standing or they want to raise? Okay, so, um, member, I think you could rephrase that. I draw that, Please. Madam Speaker. This country is filled with hypocrites and the parliament is not devoid of some. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. Can, Madam Speaker, 48-4. Please proceed. Madam Speaker, I have noticed, I have noticed very, very carefully because I studied criminology too, you know, at master's degree level in the University of London from whence I came. And Madam Speaker, I have noticed that a retired justice of appeal in this country called Mr. Stanley John issued a report in respect of the legal firearm regime in this country. And he told the country in that report, Madam Speaker, that what transpired was a well-oiled, to use his words, a well-oiled criminal enterprise. And I have noticed that not one of my friends on the other side, outside of this house or inside of this house, have ever once mentioned it and come in to talk to me about crime today. Not one, not one word, not one question, not one motion, not a squeak, not from Separia, not from Naparima, not from St. Augustine, not one. And all I will ask, and they must tell me in this debate, is why not? And Madam Speaker, the member for Naparima filed this motion. He filed this motion, and I did not hear, we talking about crime, you know. I did not hear one word about Ramdeen or Ramlogan. Not one word about EMBD. Not one word about life sport, which the records show cost plenty lives in this country. And what started Madam out, Speaker, what started Madam out, Speaker, once again, 48 won this motion is not about the UNC and Ram Lugan and etc. Please continue. Thank you very much. 
We are talking about crime, and I can tell you about crime as a minister of national security. Not a word about life sport. Not a word, not a mention of a company called SIS. And again, I must ask as I pass on, Madam Speaker, why not? And that's why I told you, Madam Speaker, this country, this country full of a set of hypocrites. And this parliament is part of this country. Madam, Madam Speaker. 48, 4 and 6, Madam Speaker. I ruled when the member made a certain comment as regards persons on a particular side. The member has still since corrected that and said that the country is full of hypocrites and this parliament is not, uh, you know, excluded from that. I allow that. Madam Speaker, year to date, as at today's date, Madam Speaker, I'm being disturbed. Could you protect me? Members, we are early in the debate. I'm sure every member who wishes to contribute will have an opportunity. So let's get on with it. Madam Speaker, year to date, the police have, re they have retrieved 153 firearms, 28 rifles, 83 pistols, 25 revolvers, 5 shotguns, 2 submachine guns, 10 handmade guns. A total of 153, and they have arrested around those 215 people. A serious focus on illegal firearms, because we know they are contributing 87% of the murders of which the member for Naparima spoke, as though it was new in Trinidad and Tobago. So the police service, in response to this, have instituted a patrol and deployment policy and that was launched and operationalized throughout the police service, spreading the resources they have, generating more presence and more visibility to give comfort to the citizens of the country. I oversaw the institution of that before the Christmas last in the city of Port of Spain, and I consulted with some of the business owners personally who told me about how effective it was, and I'm aware it was happening in Arima, it was happening in Point Fortin, it was happening in San Fernando and Chaguanas as well. The municipal police, one of the initiatives of this government was to strengthen the municipal police platform by 1,400 officers, 100 each for each of the municipalities, so that they could focus on the business of local property and cemeteries and so on and these kinds of basic stuff, public property in their, in, their, in, their, in their spaces and allow the national police to do its work otherwise. He didn't speak a word about that today in this motion. Trying to create what the police call a safe city and in so doing, division, divisions of the police service have increased their foot and mobile patrols in an effort to improve the feeling of safety and security to deter would-be offenders in the pursuit of this safe city uh, initiative. Only last night, I got a call from a constituent of mine who reported to me that there was an incident close to his home, and he told me, and I verily believe it to be true, within the space of 10 minutes, Madam Speaker, 13 police cars responded to that last night in, in the MOVA district. And I was very proud because I'm aware of the institution of this patrol and deployment policy. In addition to that, partnership with Crime Stoppers to encourage people, Madam Speaker, to give information anonymously to the police. We came here with whistleblower legislation, Madam Speaker, 
asking our friends on the other side to support a regime, a legal regime, where people who give information that the police need, whether it is in civil matters, whether it is in land grabbing issues out of the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries, as is very prevalent today, revealed by a recent minister, whether it is in respect of criminal activity so that those whistleblowers could be protected, the member for Separia, the member for Naparima, the UNC in this parliament refused to support that and come in today to tell us about crime. We established an informant fund, not new, but a targeted and improved and increased one throughout all the divisions of the police service to cultivate informants because information is the lifeblood of the intelligence platform and fighting crime. So we will know who making calls to criminals in the jail and promising them contracts if they win election. Thank God they did not win. I given them. Hear what Sipari asking me. Please Madam Speaker, thank you very much. The issue of dangerous drugs. I told this country a few years ago, a parent, a grieving parent complained to me about what, she, what he observed his son going through. It led me to call a member of the police service. A search was done and they found a substance. That substance is now known as ketamine or ketamine. It was not on the dangerous drug schedule. The police confirmed that. I then went to the Minister of Health and after they did all their research, today that is a drug on the dangerous drug schedule in this country. And recently, the police conducted a raid in the Trin City area and found 12 kilograms of it and amphetamines as well to protect our children. We have an organization called to, uh, the, the Transnational Organized Crime Unit busy up and down the place trying to deal with these kinds of matters. Today we have a focus on courier services because we are seeing activity. We know that they are using our legal ports to do this business. So we are focused on improving our border management and control. Evidence-based approaches is another one, the use of intelligence and technology in analysis and investigations. Only last night I was at a reception to close off a training program between some law enforcement personnel from East Midlands in the United Kingdom. This was hosted by the British High Commissioner to Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Harriet Cross. And I would hear from these officers and their counterparts in Trinidad who they spent the last two years with, how they benefited from the exchange of information and the techniques as we seek to professionalize the police service, further professionalize it so that it could become more efficient in doing what it has to do, Madam Speaker. So when the motion talks about the government, of course the police service is part of the executive, it not being part of the judiciary, it not being part of the legislature. It is, and that's why a minister of national security is accountable to this parliament for it. But when we talk about who had to fight crime, it's not the government or the cabinet, it's the police. So what we are doing, Madam Speaker, what we are doing is providing them with the resources and the encouragement and the exposure and the training so that they can do their job. That's what we're doing. And we take a joint agency approach in doing this. The member mentioned that five prisoners escaped. Of course, that is unfortunate. And he talked about how they come through some roof. Well, I want to let you know, Madam Speaker, those buildings were there before 2010. And they were there through the period 2010 to 2015 and three months. 
and the buildings were just as they left them. And I can tell you, they left an unworthy, if you like, remand prison in Golden Grove. And recently we completed under contract with a private contractor in this country, the repair and refurbishment of the south block of the Golden Grove Remand Prison. And the work has now started on the north wing. That is to improve the conditions for the inmate and to cut out the business of slopping out, as they called it, using pails and all of that, Madam Speaker. And most of all, or as well, in compliance with the constitutional standards as set by the constitutional courts in this country. They didn't leave that, we did that. We now have a remand court on the prison compound. They didn't do that, we did that. So we are encouraging our officers to apply more and more elements of the scientific method it is for that reason that recently the Ministry of National Security, in collaboration with the police service, established and had an all-day symposium with international participants dealing with the scientific method. And that was only one right behind that. We had another one sponsored by the uh, UN LIREC. And so the story goes, Madam Speaker. It is a work in progress. We are continuing to further enhance and professionalize the entire law enforcement pl platform so they could do what they want, they, they must do. Recently, we dismantled the SORT, which had some serious issues and challenges. Not the least, a lurking issue in respect of two persons who are alleged to have died in their custody, not the least. And that has been, re well, a new unit, a national operations task force has now been formed as part of the development of special tactical teams, Madam Speaker, in response to the situation in dealing with crime. Enhanced border control, as I said earlier, the, the purchase of two vessels, and when we sought to purchase those vessels, the UNC objected to it. They wrote a letter to the Australian Attorney General alleging corruption, and they were ignored. So what we on this side see is every time we try to fight crime in this country, the UNC gets in the way. And I can tell you as a parliamentarian, and a member of the Legislative Review Committee, when we, the government, are contemplating bringing laws to respond to the behavior of criminals, we don't only have to consider the criminals, we also have to consider our friends on the other side because we know they're going to object. So we have to draft legislation with the criminals in mind and with the UNC in mind. How to avoid them. They want everything with special majority. And they don't want it, as the Prime Minister said, because they want to support it. They want special majority so they could vote against it and come in today to ask us about crime. Madam Speaker, as I said for the third time, this country is full of hypocrites, and this parliament is not exempt. In respect of violent crimes generally, here what the CAPA statistics reveal. In 2019, 1,531 violent crimes re re reported. In 2020, 1,536 violent crimes. And in 2021, 1,166 again a decrease, demonstrating that my friend for Naparima is as wrong as a O. full of hype and bluster and provocation. 
And in so far, Madam Speaker, as arrests are concerned for violent crimes, to date, 169 persons have been arrested for those. For the last three years, inclusive of the period from January to March 2022, there has been a cumulative figure of 4,402 violent crimes. And the detection rate has moved in respect of those from 27% to 34.6%. I say congratulations to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service for that. And we will provide the resources and the directions as we must and all else that we can do so that that will continue, Madam Speaker. I told you a while ago, Madam Speaker, whether it was the, he asked, the member for Naparima asking us about the anti-gang law, you will recall, Madam Speaker, when I say you in collective perspective, pluralistic application, Madam Speaker, you being a pronoun that has singular and pluralistic application, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, the anti-gang law, the UNC in government at a time came to this parliament, we gave them support. When it was time to refurbish the law after its five years with the sunset clause, we went to the UNC because by now we were in government. They refused. We came back a second time. They refused again. The attorney general at the time had to water down the provisions and disregard the bail act amendments, which said that if you were charged under the anti-gang law, you will get no bail or bail would be restricted in certain circumstances. The UNC ensured that the criminals did not have to face that. And that is why I, my speak, Madam Speaker, and I'll take responsibility. I came to the conclusion that there are parliamentarians in this world who will not support certain laws because they are worried about how it will affect them. And they leave the people to languish. The whistleblower law I told you, recently I as Minister of National Security came to this house and piloted, and it is still under the attention of this house, a bill to deal with integrity testing. Because we know that there are persons in the law enforcement platform. In fact, I have said since 1995 in this house that a lot that happens cannot happen without the complicity of certain elements of the state. Even what you're seeing now in the Ministry of Agriculture, white collar crime, it could not happen without elements of the state complicitous. A lot of corruption that did take place in this country happened with the support of government officials and in some cases, former government ministers. And that is why plenty former government ministers in front of the court and police watching them today. And we always tell them, and I say again today, the wheels of justice may turn slowly, but they turn. And as a whole police, I know once you commit a crime, you cannot uncommit it. So whatever you did, one day, one day, there'll be a policeman with sufficient time and determination to come after you. And I'll tell you on that score, we realize that there are many crimes, particularly white color crimes, that go unattended because the numbers are so great. And the limited resources of the police investigative units challenge to deal with it. So this government has taken the position and I answered a question on Tuesday from an independent senator whether the government is prepared to use the provisions under the SRP Act to hire people with certain skills in forensic accounting, for an example, in auditing and that kind of thing, analysis, statistical analysis, and, 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 and th those kinds of skills, Madam Speaker, to go into the police service even as SRPs, 
not to pretend to play hockey and pretend to play football and just give them a salary. The real thing. The real thing. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. Right now we have a project taking place on the Beatum. I got a call yesterday from the WASA officials that they are being tormented by certain elements of the community. One of those elements was described in this parliament by one of my friends on the other side as one of we soldiers. And I'm aware because I practice law and I sat in a court one time and see a colleague of mine defending that individual. And when I heard the rap sheet, 69 pending matters. 69. And it was he was described as one of the soldiers on the beat -em. One of those offenses for which he was convicted was possession of a firearm. And I can tell you, Madam Speaker, very close to some of my friends. Very close. But Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the member for Naparima spoke about preventative issues. I don't know which government could take credit for that more than the People's National Movement. Madam Speaker, last Sunday, and let me give you one example. I went to the home of a constituent of mine. His name is, and I'm going to put his name on the parliament record, Wilburn Critchlow, an ordinary humble citizen, a CPEP worker. His wife is a minimum wage earner as well. But they are decent and prayerful and hardworking people. And I went to join them in celebration. Their young, beautiful daughter, age 20 now, Sachel Critchlow, Madam Speaker, earned herself an open scholarship in natural sciences. And Madam Speaker, when I looked and I behold, when I bless my eyes on that child, cool, calm, well-spoken, confident, prayerful, appreciative, close to her family, I saw where the strength of the family is critical. I saw where her own personal ambition and drive and prayerfulness and faithfulness are critical. But I also saw government policy at work. The CPEP was born out of this government's vision and policy to create employment and take care of the environment. Her father is a part of that. And they now occupy a house that they are paying for, but it was produced through and under the HDC government's housing policy. So wrapped up in the success and the beauty of what I told you, I saw the strength of the family. I saw education policy at work, and I told her if she, when she go to, 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 to execute that open scholarship, if she got a first class degree, she will get masters and PhD at the expense of the state in good government policy. I told her that. I saw the work of her teachers. I saw good housing policy. I saw employment policy. Madam Speaker, what am I saying? I am saying, Madam Speaker, that we have an education system here. We have a situation in Trinidad where every individual can go to the highest, like Keishon Walcott, in sport, in academics, in business. And I'm responding to Naparima, who talks about preventative. And we have a Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, which has a whole lot of programs, including the Homestead Program, where we will teach them the techniques of agriculture and provide them with state land so that they can do it. Led by Minister Foster Cummins, Madam Speaker. One minute left. I have one minute left. Madam Speaker, there's so much more to be said, but time doesn't permit me to say it. 
So I would conclude, Madam Speaker, by saying that this motion was based on a false and reckless premise and adequately described on the statistics to be so. I'm saying that the UNC can do better. My friend Naparima and his colleagues could do better rather than come here and complain about crime as they try to do in this motion, but to support the efforts of this parliament and the people of this country to protect us against those who want to hurt us as criminals. And I'm saying, Madam Speaker, we, this government, have a strong record of creating opportunities for every single citizen in Trinidad and Tobago. And that's the most preventative element. But there are individuals who choose to walk otherwise, and we have a restorative and a, a, a re-entry policy at, in, in, in vogue at the prison service to deal with them if that becomes necessary. Madam Speaker, we will continue to provide the resources to law enforcement. We will continue to be vigilant, and we are confident that we will win this battle, Madam Speaker. We were voted, for, we were elected in 2015. We were elected again in 2020, and we expect to be elected again in 2025. The people don't want that. Time is now spent. Support it. Thank you. Member for Superior. Thank you very much, Member Madam Speaker. Member for Superior, you have 30 minutes. 30 minutes. I thank you very much, Madam. I had not intended to contribute in this debate today, but I could not sit there and listen to what I would say on truths being told by the Honorable Minister Hines, the Minister of National Security, without setting the record straight. Because on several, several points raised by the Honorable Minister, they were distortions of the truth, or they were outright untruths. And I, I will draw that to the attention of this honorable house. But before I do that, madam, let us recognize that Trinidad and Tobago is under siege. Trinidad and Tobago is under siege due to this, the incompetence and negligence of the present government. I want to congratulate and endorse the points made by the Honorable Member for Naparima in his excellent contribution in the debate on the motion brought by him. I think everyone understands that one of the key functions of any government, one of the key functions, in fact, that I would think is the most important function, is the safety and security of its citizens. It must be. It, that must be of the utmost importance because if you are not secure and safe, if you're dead, you cannot enjoy any other benefit from the state. And therefore, it is our view, based on the statistics and other points raised by my colleague, colleague that this government has failed in every aspect in keeping citizens safe and secure. The government has created, uh, MP Charles said it, you know, honorable member for Naparima said it in his contribution. We are not asking you for a list and a repetition of your list to say you want to do one and you want to do two and want to do three and you want to do five. And it is again, in some instances, a repetition of promises, PNM promises never materialize. Come in again today to place a list rather than telling us, well, okay, we did this, we did that, we did the other. What are the outcomes? What are the results? So you tell us you did some repairs on the south block of the prisons and so on. Was that before the jailbreak or after the jailbreak? What have you done after the jailbreak? I know that there was a select committee, there was a jailbreak during our term. 
There was a joint select committee set up to look into that matter, and they came up with many recommendations. Have you carried out any of those recommendations? Have you done anything about it? So that we saw the fiasco with the recent jailbreak. Well, let's move along. This government has shown that they just don't care in terms of reducing crime and so on. They have failed the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I saw the acting commissioner of police has been trying his best to downplay the reality of the situation. But from newspaper reports, first-hand accounts, social media, and from just one-on-one -on -one talking to people, crime remains a major problem under this government. People do not feel safe in this country, in their homes or outside of their homes. And this week, we saw the Minister of National Security telling us that there was a criminal alliance being formed between gangs. Minister, you repeated it today. Where is he? Is he here? Talk and left. Okay, that's okay. Some of us do it. So you said it today about the, you call, um, where death of a gang leader causing merging among gangsters. Okay, well, you know that. So what are you doing about it? It's one thing to come and say is somebody died or is it gangs emerging. What are your plans? What do you hope to do? Nothing can you tell us about what you will do with this. Likewise, you raise several other pro problems, but you will not tell us what you're going to do. You talk about the Stanley John report. Stanley John report into what you said, criminal and Well, what are you doing about it? You say we come and cry and complain. Why are you complaining? You have a Stanley John report, spent time and money maybe. What is the government going to do about that report as it concerns crime? Have you done anything at all? Or is it just like the COVID-19 report that you put a team and you get all these recommendations, nothing is done. Paper on shelf collecting dust. So don't come and tell us, complain what, 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 where and where, and then you cannot tell this parliament or tell this nation what you will do about it. You talked about legislation, Honorable Minister, and I think it is, it is shameful, maybe not for you, but for this government, that you came in this parliament and told the parliament, your government, yes, your former AG, where is he too? He's not here. Your former AG told this parliament, we know where the gangs are, we know the members, 400 gangs, we know their names, we know their addresses. Yes, just pass this law and we're going to pick up everybody. How many did you pick up? How did it help you? And then the untruth that we did not support the anti-gang legislation, totally untrue. We gave you that support. We gave you the support to pass the anti-gang legislation. So again, you have been untrue. And since I'm on legislation, let me tell you how many pieces of legislation the opposition gave you support for in the fight against crime. But yes, still what happens? Crime is skyrocketing. So it's not about legislation only. And there you go again, blame the UNC. UNC will not support you, will not support your legislation. And that's why crime is out of hand. Blame us again, no. We are not taking that blame. You are to blame. Your government is to blame. Your government is to blame. You came here, you wanted a special majority bill passed. We gave it to you under tax information exchange agreements. You came here, you wanted our support on Income Tax Amendment Act. 6th of 2020, we gave you that support. So don't come here and say we are hypocrites because we don't support your legislation and that's why you cannot succeed. I saw the, the former AG, a relative of his saying, oh, he became frustrated because the opposition will not give him support for the bills that he drafted and brought. Not true. We gave you support, three, for the mutual assistance, mutual administrative assistance in tax matters. All of these are to do with crimes and white collar crimes, Madam Speaker. So we support you with that. Three, four, we supported you with a copyright amendment act, again, to deal with infringes of the law and therefore in the help against crime. We gave you support for the Sexual Offenses Amendment Act 19 of 2019. Madam Speaker, it really angers me that they will get up time and time again in this parliament and repeat the same, the same, the same untruths. The same. Then we have 
I said the Sexual Offenses Amendment Act 19 of 2019. They came and asked for support special majority, the Anti-Terrorism Amendment Act 13 of 2018. We gave you that support too. Have you found any terrorists yet? Have you implemented any part of this legislation? No, so do not blame the UNC and the opposition for doing their job. Do not blame us. You come, you want to pass the law, we gave you the support, you pass the law, and you still have to come here and cry and say, is the UNC blocking you because we're not passing the law? It is your own failure and your own incompetence. That is what it is. We gave you support for the Insurance Act, number four of 2018. We gave you support for other bills. The Anti-Gang Act, you spoke about it. Let, let me remind you of the chronology and of what happened. You brought the act. We said we did not agree with it. Okay? Then it, it, would have, it, it could not have been brought back in that same session. You all remember that? The truth will always come out, you know. Afterwards, because there was a hue and a cry, and we said, okay, if this is going to help fight the crime, I wrote to you. I wrote to the government. I said, listen, we will give you the support for two things. One, you can bring it back in the same session. Bring it back. You brought it back, and we gave you the special majority support. You tell us you know who they are. Let me repeat that. We know the names. How many gangs did they say? 400, whatever. We know the names of the gang members. We know the addresses. We know where to find them. Just give us this. And we will find him, and we will lock them up. So said, not so done. Not done at all. We gave you the Licensing Committee Validation Act 2018. We gave you the Tax Information Exchange Agreements U.S. Act, number 4 of 2017. And the list goes on, madam. I've listed here several, and I want to talk on other points, but this is just to show that it is totally untrue to say the opposition is not given the support for the special majority bills. But if you want to talk about legislation, and legislation is not the cure-all, not the panacea or whatever is the word for dealing with crime. It's not. It is one part. My, my colleague MP Charles spoke about it must be a holistic approach. But let's deal with legislation. You promised this country pepper spray legislation. Where is it? All over Trinidad after the death of, of, of a daughter of our soil, holding vigil and crying crocodile tears. Yes, pepper spray. Yes, pepper spray. Where is it? And you know where it's stuck, I'm told? And please tell us that's true. It is stuck. The regulations have been done, but I'm told it's been stuck in the Ministry of National Security because certain things have to be done there. With respect to the regulations and the quantities and the chemicals and all the technicalities, it's stuck there. So I say, PNM promises never materialize. Pepper spray, where is it? Talk about legislation again. When that incident happened, again, with a daughter of our soil, the issues of pH taxis came up. You remember that? Remember that? They promised pH legislation. Where is it? Where is the pH legislation? You promised as well to deal with issues of a sex offenders registry. Is that operationalized? Is it working? How many people are on that um, registry? How many? How many? Several other pieces of legislation to help crime. We talked about, um, you talked about, well, we did. I, we passed the law, my government, our government at that time, dealing with the GPS bracelets. Do you remember that? GPS bracelets, what is the status of that? Has one person got a GPS bracelet in this country yet after so many years? And you want to come and tell us is the UNC not passing law for you? The UNC not supporting the law is on the books and you are not implementing the law. You're not implementing the law. You talked about the statistics not skyrocketing. Well, you, nothing is further from the truth. I repeat the statistics. I endorse what my colleague MP Charles gave, and it is clear that crime, it's crime is skyrocketing. If I believe, 
as you hold yourself out to be that you're a lawyer, I'm sure you can do arithmetic and mathematics. And you will see clearly that the numbers are skyrocketing when it comes to the statistics dealing with crime. And let me tell you, every time the PNM is in power, every single time, the crime starts to go up. Every time, every time, why? Why is that? Let's look at the stats you wanted to talk about when we were there. You say they're not skyrocketing, but look at what we left you. Serious crimes, murders, homicides. Last full year, we were there 403. What happened under your watch? Where is it now? As the last full year, you were there 448. Immediately, you came into office. 2016, 463. 2017, 494. Continue to climb under your watch. Why? Why is that? Why is that? And that's a serious question you have to ask. Why is it under the PNM that crime climbs up and escalates, Madam Speaker? Why? If you could answer that, then you may be able to help solve the problems that we are facing. And let me give you one example. You want to come and tell us here today about some, I don't know who it is you were referring to, when you said some members or members want to give contract to people in jail if they win election, that it's totally untrue, totally untrue. And if you want to know who funds criminal enterprises and who funds the criminals in this country, it is not the partnership, it is not the UNC, I'll tell you who they are. It is long known that the PNM cultivates an intimate relationship with criminal elements, I'll prove that, madam, I'll prove it from former Prime Minister Manning meeting with so-called community leaders. Do you all remember that? Meeting community leaders to actively providing state funds to them. The evidence is there. Money is provided to so-called community leaders whom everybody knows as just a, a euphemism for something else. In a recent matter, the Guardian Media investigated and in 2019 found that near $6 million $6 million given to gang leaders through state contracts by two PNM controlled corporations. And you want to come today and point fingers at us to say we make a deal with people in jail. When this is an investigative report carrying the Guardian, I have the, the um, citation here recently. So if that is not funding crime, then tell me what is when you give the six million in state contracts to two gang leaders, to gang leaders by PNM control corporations. Let me quote from that article, madam. Seven reputed gang leaders in North Trinidad have benefited from state contracts worth close to $6 million in spite of assurances by government to the contrary. In spite of that, they were given by PNM corporations. This is in 2019. Continuing the quotation. The money was paid to alleged gang leaders based in communities in Port of Spain to Diego Martin eras over the last three years. 2016, 17, 18, 19. Three years from 19, go backwards. Continuing the quotation. This information, here it comes from, madam, is contained in a confidential eight-page special branch report prepared in mid-May, mid-May, that was obtained as part of a Guardian media investigation just a week after Police Commissioner Gary Griffith blamed the state for placing funds in the hands of gang leaders. So who is funding the gang leaders now? Who is funding the gang leaders? And you are so bold-faced, excuse me, madam. So hypocritical for anyone, anyone, to say that UNC promising contracts the people in jail. Can you think about it, madam? Six million dollars. Think of how many guns and drugs that six million would have sp been spent on taxpayers' dollars. Guns brought from that same money paid by the government money, you know, you know, this is government, your money, taxpayers' dollars, given by this government. That, in my respectful view, is funding the criminal elements. The minister spoke as well about, and I'm trying to respond to it, what I've said, many untruths that he um, put forward here today. Municipal police officers. I mean, how can you really, really? Why don't you ask a new minister of what is it, local government or something? 
I wonder if he even knows that you were telling an untruth when you said that your government has hired 1,400 municipal police officers. Totally untrue. You promised 1,400, but what did you do? So far, I am told it's only 300. You promised 1,400, it's only 300, and it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. You had 300, you promised 1,400, and yet you are bold-faced enough, excuse my language, it is hypocritical, hypocritical and not true for anyone to come and say 1,400. 300! Boast about something that's not true. And then when you have these 300, what I mean to all, there is no allocation, there are no resources. Order. 48 four, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Hypocritical, they objected to the use of the word. I made no ruling that the word hypocritical in itself was unparliamentary. I allow it. Please continue in the context of me. Continue, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I can't see her. Huh? It'll be bigger. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Bigger. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I'm saying this is hypocritical for anyone. And in fact, they'll be guilty of a, a blatant untruth to say that 1,400 were hired. Our information is, and we are very involved in local government, I have here at least three practitioners, four, who come from out of local government, that is only 300. And it doesn't stop there, madam. So one thing you had is 300 when you promised 1,400. But on top of that, they have no resources. They have no allocations. So what you do, you just hire 300 people there to do what? Mark time? So don't come and boast about the, um, about the municipal police, because as I've said before, not true. And then we hear this strange statement, um, which is, sorry, madam, I'm just checking the time. Again, if I may ask for the clock, if possible at all, um, it's really a, a strain to look. The other side has the advantage, they have it in front of them. So I think it's, Will Madam guide me, please? How many more minutes? You end at 4.22. It is now 4.12. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you. Let's come to the... Um, the minister said, it is not for the government to fight crime. It is not for the government to fight crime. I started my contribution by saying that the first and foremost, the paramount duty of any government in a civilized democratic state, such as we hope we are, I think we are, is the safety and security of its citizens. That's a priority, madam, and I explained why at the start. Minister Den said, we just provide the resources. Well, first of all, that is not true. That's another untruth. Because a lot of vital resources have not been provided, one, and two, even when allocated in the budgets each year, they are not released. So you don't really provide the resources that they need. Instead, you are providing resources at 80 million, 25 million, whatever, to look for, what they say, um, looking for ghosts behind every post, saying you're tracking down former ministers and whoever. And you see, the, the, the intention is clear. You know, the minister said it here today in whichever words, he will lock up everybody. He wants to talk about people from the partnership and the UNC, but he will not talk about that only person charged is one of his ministers, former ministers. Will, us, will not tell us that there are still serious questions outstanding with respect to, I'm not doing a substantive, so, but there are questions about the Honourable Member for Ruka Maloney about some bank account. We have issues dealing with former Minister Dillon. You remember that elderly something abuse? You have the Daryl, the former Daryl Smith. So look, fellas, when you point so four fingers pointing back at you, you know, and all these name callings and all these things is not going to help you to fix the crime problem. It will not help you. All these blames, it will not help you. So he says, not government to fight crime. 
to provide resources, but it's not working if that's your approach. If that is how you see it in terms of solving crime or helping reduce crime, obviously that is not working because the stats show that you're clearly, crime is increasing. So your approach is totally wrong. Your approach is totally wrong. What it is, it is, is yeah, it is what it is. You are not to go in <coughs> to the TPTPS and go direct and tell them investigate this one and investigate that one and pay millions of dollars to select whom to be investigated. That you should not do. That should never be done. But what you can do is to provide an enabling environment for the administration of safety and security. How do you do that? In the few minutes I have left, I'll probably give it to one of my colleagues to, to deal with that. Um, thank you. We have a lot of things we have talked about. We talked about the administration now, madam. Obviously, what we have is not working. We had suggested on this side what we do. We split the ministries. National security alone is obviously failing on the job, falling down on the job. So we have a ministry of home security, which will deal with certain aspects of the job, those on the land. You have a ministry of um, a ministry that will deal with other matters. Uh, you will have a ministry of homeland security. And these are some of the suggestions we had made in the past, and I'll pass this note to my colleagues, given the time constraints. Let me um, thank you, madam, for opening up the restrictions in the parliament, allowing us to sit together as a community, as a body um, of the Democratic Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and to thank you for relaxing the, uh, the speaking time. We became a little accustomed to the 20 minutes, and now the 45 minutes uh, gives us more time to expatiate and so on. So can we thank the speaker, please, for these restrictions being lifted? I think it will be in better defense of our security. So we talked about having a Ministry of Home Affairs, dealing with the primarily with internal law enforcement and focus on policing. We suggested a Ministry of Defense, which would be based on the critical need for protection of our borders, illegal entry of drugs, weapons, human trafficking, and so on. The minister spoke about those things, but no solution. The Ministry of Defense will be newly established based on new threats and clear and present danger, which faces all nations at this time. That Ministry of Defense will incorporate the Defense Force, Immigration, Customs, and so on to handle border control. And then we could look at a ministry of um, dealing with the uh, Home Affairs, as I said, TTPS, Fire Service, Police Service, Disaster Preparedness, and then a Ministry of Justice. I saw the Prime Minister complaining the other day, they're giving all the resources to judiciary and justice is so slow, but no, no. Again, it's not just about resources. And again, it's not true you're giving them all the resources. You will do as best as you can. So we had these suggestions. We talk about bail reform. We talk about increasing the age of retirement for the, for the, um, the Coast Guards. These guys are retiring at a relatively young age, whereas in other jurisdictions, they increased, I suggested an increase of three years, because in other jurisdictions, here I think it's 45 or something, a very low age that they have to go. We suggested that we do um, some errors that we're uh, identifying um, hot zones. We talked about diploma, diplomas and undergraduate um, studies for police officers. Um, these could be done at the Davy campus. We talked about the forensics to be done like there as well. We talked about pre-trial detention and bail reform. Talked about so many other approaches. So it's not just about we give them the resources. You have to create the environment within which they can operate more efficiently. You have to give state support to the children of incarcerated persons, persons in jail. How do children live? we have to provide some support of them. And I talked already about the GPS bracelets and so on. So madam, some measures for immediate relief, grant powers of arrest to all members of the Defense Force to break the monopoly of the TTPS. Let them work together. They can work together. I remember you laughed at us when we had brought a bill to give them those powers. You call it the soldier. Not the soldier, but you call it the soldier bill or something like that. Let's look at that. Zone all high crime areas and spots and have a dedicated task force commander. Appoint a senior officer as a national security operation commander to plan and coordinate all operations of these zones. Institute 
metrics for crime reduction, which is what my colleague spoke about, instituted um, outfit the Coast Guard so they can be more efficient, and of course, fund them for the, for the fuel and the diesel and so on, they, meant, they mean. Establish a National Security Investigation Bureau for investigating national security personnel. Madam, madam, these are just some. I want to make the point again. I totally endorse and support the motion brought by my colleague on this issue dealing with crime. I thank you very much. Minister of Energy and Energy Industries. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise today to join this debate that quite ironically started off by the member for Napa Rima moving his motion, not even understanding his own motion and facing the indignity of having him be ruled irrelevant on a number of times of his own drafted motion. And it has only deteriorated since then. I'd like to try to raise the level of conversation, Madam Speaker, through you to really explain as we as citizens examine this phenomenon of crime. There is not a single civic-minded citizen anywhere in the world who is not concerned about crime, criminality, the effects of crime and criminality on their respective countries. Trinidad and Tobago is no different. There is no sensible person that would bury his or her head in the sand and pretend that the difficulties of criminality don't exist in Trinidad and Tobago. The question must become, and the conversation must be one for us as legislators in this house as to what can we do to be part of the solution part of the solution and part of the defense against crime, but also how do we respond to crime and what is it that we can do, firstly, as elected members of parliament, members of the legislature, to deal with crime and criminality. And that starts with the passage of legislation. Ironically, and once again, unfortunately, in an attempt to mislead the population, the previous speaker, the member for Separia, took the time in a prepared speech for her to list certain elements of legislation that she said, that the member for Separia said the UNC opposition supported the government over the last seven years with respect to bills and the passage of legislation to deal with crime. In case the population is misled by that, the vast majority of acts that were referred to by the member for Separia had to be passed. And I remind the population of in 2016, when the country was on the brink of a disaster and a crisis, and we were at the risk of becoming a de-risked sovereign nation. And that is what the vast majority of the legislation that the member for Separia listed that they supported had to be done. Because at the time, the US, the United States of America had said if that legislation was not passed, and I remind the population that the UNC opposition refused to pass that special majority the first time, pushing us on a brink of crisis. And I asked the leader of the opposition whether either herself or her members had a meeting with the United States Embassy in Trinidad where they were told if the legislation wasn't passed, what would happen to Trinidad and Tobago. And to remind the population, it was the FATCA legislation, and if that was not passed, we would have been de-risked. So they were not supportive of it. The record shows that initially they did not support it, and it is only when the pressure came and the population realized where the UNC had put Trinidad and Tobago that we would become de-risked, which meant parents would not be able to send money for their children at school away. The business community would not be able to pay their US bills away and their suppliers away. Credit cards in Trinidad and Tobago would no longer be allowed to be used by the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Then the UNC caved in and had to support the legislation to stand here today and list 
four pieces of legislation that they supported that are special majority pieces of legislation in an attempt to mislead the population to say, look, we supported crime-fighting legislation is wholly incorrect and, and facetious. Putting that one aside, we as legislators can pass legislation, but today I want to talk about the concept of consequences. Because you see, when I sat in the seat of Minister of National Security, it bothered me on a daily and a nightly basis as to how do we make Trinidad and Tobago safer. And the concept I want to discuss with the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago today is that of consequences. Passage of legislation is only one pillar. So we can sit here as 41 elected members and we could pass certain legislation, anti-gang legislation, a lot of hurrah from the other side is being made about that today. After, again, the record would show that the opposition, the UNC opposition resisted it, allowed it to lapse. The PNM, when in opposition, not only agreed to support anti-gang legislation, but we also agreed to support amendments to the Bail Act to be tacked on to that anti-gang legislation. So it meant that those who were charged under the anti-gang legislation would be kept incarcerated for a specific period of time to allow the police to bill out the evidence. The point is, legislation is only one part of the pillar. In my thinking, how to make Trinidad and Tobago safer, and there was a reduction of crime during that period, it became very apparent, and this is a conversation I raised time and time again with my cabinet colleagues at cabinet. Trinidad and Tobago is suffering from a lack of consequences for misbehavior, and that is the problem. Legislation is only one pillar. When you examine a criminal justice system, and that is what the conversation should be about, how do we improve the criminal justice system? The concept of separation of powers is thrown at you. But we as the legislators pass law. Our, our responsibility ends there. It is now for somebody to enforce the law. So as the Minister of National Security, working with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, I saw numerous examples including under the anti-gang legislation of them charging persons. One of, one of my colleagues on the other side, I think it was Barataria Sawa, earlier this week asked, again, a facetious question, well, how many people have been convicted under the legislation, knowing fully well that the government has no role to play in the conviction? A conviction, it starts off, we pass the legislation. We, we do the policy, we provide the resources. The next thing that must happen is that persons, the police service, will charge persons. And that has happened. We've had it, statistics provided here time and time again of how many people have been charged under the anti-gang legislation. It is now scores of persons. Scores of persons have been charged under the anti-gang legislation. So they shift the goalposts. Tell us about convictions. The answer for convictions lies on the prosecutorial arm the defense arm, but importantly, the judiciary. And that is the part of the conversation I would like to take up here today. Because you see, unless there are consequences for corruption, unless there are consequences for criminal behavior where people feel the consequences of their wrongdoing, my submission is it will make very little difference. And that is an area that unfortunately, it's very frustrating in government you don't have much control over. How do you secure the convictions? So what we have done as an administration, and it has been going on now for years, one of the things in adjusting the criminal justice system, get rid of preliminary inquiries. How many times have we been here in debate to try and abolish preliminary inquiries? And the goalpost is always moving for the abolition of preliminary inquiries. And I heard the mo most absurd submission when I was participating in those discussions once by defense attorneys. Well, if you get rid of preliminary inquiries, the young attorneys would have no opportunity at magistrate's court to earn a fee on brief and to get experience. So people with an agenda prevent the abolition of pre preliminary inquiries to do what? To earn fees 
and to frustrate the system. That is the criminal justice system. Recently, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, as an elected member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, a constituency that has, unfortunately in it, some criminal elements, but the vast majority law-abiding citizens who are affected by that handful, that few, who engage in criminal activity. Recently, a decision was taken by that arm, which is the third arm of governance. You have the legislature, you have the government, you have the judiciary, and you have separation of powers in between. You want to really deal with crime? All three have to be pulling in the same direction. Recently, we have a decision all the way up to the Court of Appeal. No, it is now possible to apply for bail when you're on a murder charge. How could you ask the government, the police service, the law-abiding citizens, the civic-minded citizens to easily accept that now persons who are charged with murder can legitimately apply for bail, something that we've known since the Bail Act has been in place, that for the, the crime of murder, for capital offenses, the application for bail wasn't available. Well, that's changed now. And that is the criminal justice system. And ironically, today, in an article in the Trinidad Express, before coming to Parliament, the 25th of May today, it has happened. Murder accused gets bail. And this bothers me. It bothers me as an elected member of Parliament, as a person who's practiced in the courts for almost two decades before getting into politics, and as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. And it goes on, for the first time in the history of Trinidad and Tobago, a person has been granted bail for murder. It comes just over a month after the appeal court held that Section 5.1 of the Bail Act was unconstitutional, as it had removed the jurisdiction of the court to consider bail for those accused of the capital offense. And it goes on to say, and ironically, on February 17th, in a matter brought by former murder accused Akil Charles, Chief Justice Ivor ja Archie, along with Justices of Appeal Mira Dean Armourer and Malcolm Holdip, unanimously held that Section 5.1 of the Bail Act was unconstitutional as it breached the doctrine of separation of powers. So we as legislature, legislators can pass legislation here which we think is going to improve the criminal justice system, fight crime and criminality, pass it with a special majority, but then the concept of separation of powers is breached because there are others who think you all have no say in that. But it is the government who has the information on criminals through the police service, through the intelligence services. It is the government who is best placed to assist in the formulation of policy to deal with crime and criminality. This is a live example of us taking decisions, passing legislation in an attempt to fight crime and then it being derailed to an extent. The issue of consequences not applying in Trinidad and Tobago is a wide-reaching one. You have it as well throughout the whole public service. You have this problem that wrongdoers, and, and not limited to the public service, wrongdoers, persons who commit... I mean, we have another great example of it in the last two days. Anybody reading the newspapers in the last 24 hours would see a missing member of parliament today saying that there's no evidence of wrongdoing when he was a minister and hundreds of millions of dollars were corruptly siphoned out. $400 million by a state enterprise spent in the space of between August 2015 and September 2015. And to then stand up and say there's no evidence, well, I'm putting it here once again on the hands of there is the evidence. In that particular case, there's evidence that contractors are the ones who drafted the cabinet minutes, the cabinet notes, and sent it to the minister and that ministry to put before cabinet to go with the $400 million of, of, of contracts. There's also evidence that shows text messages by that missing member of parliament, bring the check to parliament so he could pay contractors. And what they do is they use the court system, which is part of the whole issue, and they delay it, delay it, delay it. But there is also a court, there is also a 
uh, High Court decision. Uh, Deputy Speaker, just seeking clarification for him. Is this matter he's talking about sub judice 49? So I raise your standard of 49.1. I'm asking. Again, remember, I'll give you some leeway. Just be Thank you. Considerate I was of, closing of it off now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by saying there is a court decision of over 100 pages that determines there was sufficient evidence of cartel behavior and corruption. It is just to correct the record to say that there is a pursuit of corruption taking place, but again, to make the example of a lack of consequences. I go on. The member, the previous speaker, the Honorable Member for Separia, who's left the chamber now, actually opened up this part of the debate. I was wondering whether to go down this road, but she opened it up frontally when she said, when the Member for Separia said a short while ago about PNM, PNM contractors and, and PNM encouraging criminality in the granting of contracts, and went on. Ironically, again, to read a Guardian article, a recent article in 2019, talking about certain corporations and the suggestion that there were criminals getting state contracts. Well, I'm uh, disappointed that the member for Separi isn't here to put this reminder to her and to the opposition. And I'm reading from a Guardian article dated Wednesday, October 9th, 2013, Spanish Mystery by Yvonne Babulal, and it talks about a Beatham community activist called Kenneth Spanish Rodriguez and the HDC and the HDC managing director, Julian John, a name that's familiar to us. And it goes on to say that Rodriguez featured prominently during a tour of the, I'm quoting from the Guardian article dated the 9th of October, 2013, Rodriguez featured prominently during a tour of the $2 million Duncan Street Police Post Project with Jolene John, Housing Minister Dr. Rudal Munila, National Speaker, Security Minister eight. Gary... I'll repeat it. This is Spanish Rodriguez. This is a Guardian article, and I'm directly referring, not rebutting, referring to what the... the Member for Separia said. So Spanish, Rodriguez featured prominently during a tour of the $2 million Duncan Street Police Post Project with Julian John, Housing Minister Dr. Rudal Munilal, National Security Minister Gary Griffith, and Acting Commissioner of Police Stephen Williams last week Friday. Rodriguez, that is Spanish, told the media that he was the contractor for the project. He met and greeted Munilal, then the Acting Prime Minister. Jolene John and her entourage and escorted them to the Mr. first Deputy and second Speaker floors of the building. Media person being referred to by the minister is a member of the Senate. And I am reading an article. Overruled. Thank you. You see, I am not making this up. I am not creating it. One, it is a fact that it happened. So don't come in here and once again try to mislead the population and play that somehow you're holier than thou, when the acting Prime Minister, Dr. Rudal Munilal, was being escorted in a police force project granted to a gang leader. And that's only one instance. I also used the opportunity, because the member for Separia opened it up and talked about, she, the, the exact language she used was funding the criminal elements. I want to remind this House that I was before a joint select committee as the Minister of National Security and provided that joint select committee with the evidence of intelligence reports with respect to members of Parliament leaving the Parliament to go to the higher to pay the drinks bill for gangs and gang members. Members of Parliament for the opposition who are members of Parliament in the south of Trinidad asking gang leaders from Digo Martin to come to their constituency office. So don't come here and tell the country that you don't know about funding criminal activities. And that is the problem. Because you see, if the legislators 
are having these direct relationships with money involved. Not even the granted of contracts, you know, paying their drinks bill and calling them to the constituency office. If they're having those types of relationships, don't come here and tell the country that you're worried about crime because you're part of the problem. The member for Separia, again, I have to say maybe it is that because she's reading a prepared speech, did not have put before her about the GPS system, the, the ankle bracelets. The member, the member for Lavantil West as the Minister of National Security stood here in this same booth months ago and provided a report and had a press conference to say that the courts have started making the orders for the use of the GPS, the ankle bracelets. They are being utilized. So to come here and say what has happened with it, the answer is it has been implemented. There is a whole unit at National Security that are using it that are following it, that are doing the tracking at the orders of the court. So it is happening. Again, another blatant attempt to mislead the population talking about municipal police. Yes, it was part of the PNM's plan and it remains part of the PNM's plan in government to ensure that every corporation has 100 municipal police. And I heard this statement with my own ears from the member for Separia saying only 300. Again, a complete Untruth, there are 726 municipal police, and the only thing that stopped and prevented it from continuing was COVID. There were difficulties during the COVID period of recruiting and training, but I'm told that there's currently, right now, a batch of municipal police being trained. So don't come here and try and create hysteria. Don't come here and try and use the cover of crime to mislead the population, as is usual. We all know pepper spray is a great example of us as legislators passing the legislation and waiting for it to be implemented. And that is what is going on. So again, put the responsibility where the responsibility is due. PNM creates a culture of relationships with criminals. That was the quotation I took down from the member for Separia. And you know, I'm standing here and I'm looking across the aisle and recalling those in intelligence reports that call the names of persons on the other side who are in deep relationships. I heard the member for Lavantil West and unfortunately the Minister of Public Utilities isn't here talk about the Beatum project. Again, even up to recently, there's suggestions that the, the discord, the type of behavior that went on in Beta by a small handful of people on that sewerage project and who it was on the other side that was related and, and, and encouraging the criminal behavior. So if you're encouraging the criminal behavior, don't come here and try and tell the population that nothing is being done about crime when you are actively encouraging it. Consequences and the lack of consequences, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That's the submission. And the submission is that we all have a role to play. We have a role to play as legislators. The government has a role to play in directing policy and resources, which it is doing. There was a lot of hullabaloo made by the member for Naparimia and the member for Separia about the prison system and a recent prison break. Every prison break is an unfortunate incident. And let's not fool ourselves that that only happens in Trinidad and Tobago. I remember it was in June or July of 2015, just before a massive prison break, where a police officer was killed. And that was under the Kamala Persaud Bicessa led government. And then to stand here and talk about the Minister of National Security, in the last seven years, under PNM administration, there have been three ministers of national security, myself included. In a Kamala Persaud Bicessa five year term, there were six, including one who can even leave Trinidad and Tobago to go to the United States because they're waiting for him. In an international criminal ring. 
And let us not forget that. So the member for Separia who has left the chamber, her response to crime was to appoint an international criminal as a minister of national security. And he also acted as prime minister. Six members, six ministers of national security. And then to come here today, the hypocrisy of it, a word that seems today to, to suddenly have a different meaning and say that the government has been unable to effectively prevent a surge in criminal activity resulting in rapid increases in murders, robberies, home invasions. It's insulting. It's insulting to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago standing out there. What we should be doing is working together to find ways to combat crime and the criminal element. Not having certain sitting members of parliament deep in relationships with them. Mr. Deputy Speaker, may I ask at what time my contribution ends? Finish at 4.51. Thank you. 4.51. Neglected prison infrastructure. In the last seven years, Decisions were taken at national security to improve the prison infrastructure, and that has been going on. But it's been going on at a time when, unfortunately, revenue was lower and money was difficult and not as easy as it was in the past. Again, every time I go to the east of Trinidad and drive past the traffic lights, it upsets me to see a fence that was put up in 2015 for $50 million, a fence that surrounds nothing. That $50 million is exactly just a bit more we are using, and you heard Minister Hines say, to finally improve the circumstances at the Riman Yard in Golden Grove. And that's not to be washed aside the way Separia did. Because I walked in the remand yard a number of times as a minister, and it disturbed me as a citizen to see the way that those inmates were being housed there. And we took a decision, and it is being implemented. The first wing has been completed to upgrade remand. As he said, there is video conferencing there now. The fencing is being improved. The CCTV cameras, the, the officers were provided with stab vests with personal firearms. And what do we have? That again, a former attorney general of the UNC goes to challenge the keep and carry for prison officers. So let the prison officers remember that. That it is the UNC again who has put prison officers' lives in jeopardy by challenging their keep and carry policy. So when the commissioner of prisons is giving to prison officers who are not going to be in the prison compound, but going to come back for their shift, firearms to carry. It is the UNC who challenged that to make it insecure and, and, and to put them at risk. Right? And that is on record. That decision was given in December last year. So don't come here and try and fool the people that you're really concerned about crime, you want to be part of the solution for the reduction of crime, but all how, every which way you look, there's an opposition element undermining the efforts to really combat crime. And then to hear the member talk about celebrating the capture of the escaped prisoners, which I don't know where that came from. But Remember every two more minutes. How much? Sorry. Two more minutes. But every civic-minded citizen had to have been relieved when the escaped prisoners were caught, and they were caught in less than 72 hours, all returned and being charged. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll end on this point. Let us not fool ourselves that there is any one pillar, any one solution to crime and criminality. But I think the record will clearly show and reflect that those on the other side are a part of the problem and not a part of the solution. 
and to come here, including the leader of the opposition, to try and fool the population about, we supported this piece of legislation, and 90% of the pieces of legislation, if not 95, that the member for Separia quoted they supported a special majority, was because they had to, because we were about to be de-risked as Trinidad and Tobago. Consequences. And until we have the consequences of those who took the $400 million from EMBD and put it in cartels and corruption, until we have those who call in prisoners on the inside of the prison, until we have those who are paying the bar bills at Hyatt what, for criminals. No, please, please, member, not, not like that, right? Not like that. Proceed. Thank you. They get uneasy because, you see, this is the truth. This is not just a rabble rousing and reading a speech from the back room. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to end my submission to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago through you is that until there are proper consequences for crime and criminality in Trinidad and Tobago, we have to be part of the problem and it's an all of Trinidad and Tobago approach. But the UNC opposition is doing everything they can to undermine Trinidad and Tobago becoming a safer and more secure place. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Shogonas West. And member, you have 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to start off by saying that at the beginning of member for Naparima's moving of this motion. He did categorically state that it gives him no pleasure to have to bring this motion in the parliament today. And I think I know why he said that. And the reason why he would have said it, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that there is no satisfaction to be derived by us, and we certainly do not derive any satisfaction in the spiraling crime rates. We, we do not, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I want to give a personal account of something that I have witnessed only yesterday and how I came to, to, to experience this particular tragedy and why I will say that this motion brought by member for Naparima is in fact a timely motion. So it, is, it doesn't give us any satisfaction, but it is timely because in the interest of the people, we have to raise these issues. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have had, and that is, that it is not denied, we have had the most heinous crimes on the ascendancy now, and it has been going on for some time. Yesterday, Mr. Deputy Speaker, someone whom I know was shot in the Piaco vicinity. And he's a reputable, well-known doubles vendor from Central Trinidad selling in Piaco. And he was basically plying his trade. He was doing what he is accustomed to doing. It, yes, it was very early in the morning. And he went to sell doubles, and in the course of doing that, earning his living, this happened. And how I came to know this, I mean, it, 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 this kind of news that goes through the media, social media, etc. But I also know members of the family, and I don't wish to bring them into you know, this debate, but safe to say that having gone there because the, the wife, the, the widow, now newly widow, she, had, she has taught my son in primary school, and, and, and they are also, you know, the school is in my constituency, so there are different links, and that is why I attended on the home. And having attended, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to say that I, I, I pay tribute to them. There was a tremendous amount of composure um, by family members. But the mother of this person who has died and, and was murdered, she was indicating that she can't comprehend what is going on. And members of the family were saying that they thought that, you know, at some point if they doze off to sleep, maybe they will wake up and they will realize this was but a dream. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, finding yourself in these kind of circumstances, we don't know, certainly I don't. I don't know how to begin to even, you know, start giving any kind of solace, giving any kind of comfort 
how do we comfort persons like this? And this is just yesterday, a, a very immediate situation. But my colleagues on this side, they can tell you of different incidents like these, which they have found themselves in similar positions with members of their own constituency. And this is why we are here to debate this important motion. So I want to say to member for Naparima <clears throat> that I support his motion and it is timely. And I too derive no satisfaction in having to debate something like this. But it is necessary if it is, the government intends to listen to some of the concerns. And as member for Naparima has said, if you hear the concerns, maybe you can start acting on them and we can see a turnaround in the spiral in crime. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, before I get into my contribution, <clears throat> there are a few things that I wish to respond to. And I heard the last member speak, port, member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, Minister, Honorable Minister of Energy. And he was talking about, you know, in response to member for Siparia, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, that the opposition only when it found itself in a position where there was a default position, they had no choice to support legislation. That is when they, in fact, supported the legislation. And I want to say that, you know, for the record, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is not so. And in fact, this opposition has shown that it will support legislation once it is properly brought, it is proper legislation. It balances the rights of both sides. It balances the right between the state wanting to seek good governance principles and also the rights of the individual. Once that balance is there, and we are satisfied that any encroachment on either side will be properly met. I, my friend spoke about the separation of powers principles. Once that can be met properly and, and you know, we are satisfied remedies will be granted by the court and, and these sort of instances, we will support such legislation. And I, I think he was talking about tax information exchange agreements, Act Number no. 5 of 2020, Income Tax Amendment, Act Number no. 6 of 2020, Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters, Act 7 of 2020. And those were in March of 2020, that period. And maybe those are the, 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 the pieces of legislation that he was referring to. But there are, there are other special majority bills passed with opposition support. And these include the Copyright Amendment Act No. 4 of 2020, Sexual Offences Amendment Act 19 of 2020. One was in, in March as well, 2020. One is June to September 2019. <clears throat> the Anti-Terrorism Amendment Act No. 13 of 2018, debated in July of 2018. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Anti-Gang Act. Now, I heard my friend say that, you know, this anti-gang, we were hell-bent against it. Again, there were issues that were raised by the opposition. I am not seeking to repeat what Member Fisiparia, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, said. But that bill having been brought, a position was taken once we were satisfied that we were seeing some movement from the government towards balancing the rights and ensuring that the individual rights were being protected. We gave in and we said, okay, we will now have it brought back to the House. That is what she was pointing out. Bring it back to the House in the same session and we will support it. It was passed with a sunset clause, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And that is the purpose of sunset clauses across the world. That you will then seek to look at the efficacy of that piece of legislation, knowing that it can have far-reaching consequences on the rights of individuals, and therefore, if you are satisfied that it is basically fulfilling the aim of the legislation, that you will then say it will be extended. They could not show that it was satisfying the purpose for which it was passed. But that being said, that they came and they whittled it down in whatever manner, not that we agreed with it, and they passed it with a simple majority. What has happened with the effectiveness of the anti-gang bill anti-gang law that exists as passed by them. So what is this big furor about that the opposition is not supporting them in fighting crime? That is just crying crocodile tears. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> I know that there's a utopic place that exists in the form or in the vicinity of Pine de Bal. And I expect that that person is coming 
I expect that person to come here and say, Pine di Bal. That is where you could pass laws. The opposition will support everything. They will support everything. They will give you what you want. You could keep people locked away in prison, not having been convicted for time immemorial. And according to you, in Pine de Bal, that is where crime will go down because of that. I expect that kind of submission to come here, you know, in that utopic world. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for the record, I love to go penal Debe on a Sunday morning. And I love my crispy sahina. I love my alu pies and I love my doubles. But I want to say, this debate is a serious one. And even going there, persons have a fear for risk of safety in going to these treasured places to enjoy, you know, some fine delicacies. So that is in, in terms of the, the, the legislation. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there were other pieces of legislation which were passed, which I didn't hear member for Port of Spain North St. Anne's West refer to today. And I will just say it very quickly, anti-gang, I spoke about that, Interception of Communications Amendment Act 13 of 2020. Miscellaneous provisions, um, there are so many of the miscellaneous provisions, Mr. De Mr. Deputy Speaker, a lot, a, a suite of legislation or bills came under miscellaneous provisions. And they were passed. And therefore, the question we have to ask is, I thought the government would have taken a position if they were going to mount that platform to talk about bills and legislation, talk about the effectiveness of those pieces of legislation in fighting crime. Because that is what we are ultimately here for. So there's no hurrah, according to Port of Spain, North, St. Anne's West, about the anti-gang legislation on our side. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are not shifting the goalposts, according to them. And so when he made reference to the, the change in bail law, it is somewhat anachronistic. It is, it, it is an oxymoron to say that we have to bear in mind the separation of powers principles and then seek to condemn us when it is you have lawyers who are taking positions on behalf of their clients before the courts in terms of challenging laws. That is what a democracy is. But I want to say in respect of that bail law, member for San Fernando West is here, previous att attorney general. And I want to understand what they are trying to pin on us that they spiral in crime because there has now been a successful challenge against the position that if you are a murder accused, you can apply for bail. That is what the position is. And for the Spain North, St. Anne's West, get up and like he's so happy he get this express article come through on his phone. And oh, this is the first person to come out. He didn't bother to read the conditions, a compendium of conditions that the courts put on that murder accused. Remember, it is not a murder convictor. It is a murder accused. They are entitled to go thanks to lawyers' jobs and thanks to the, the, the quality legal maneuvering. They are entitled to do that in the interest of democracy. Thanks to them that you have a position that if you are accused, not convicted, if you are accused, you can go before the court and apply. There is no guarantee that you'll get it. There are judicial principles. For centuries, you know, UNC didn't invent this. For centuries, these principles have been decided and they have been uh, accumulated in something called the common law. And this common law principles, the, the, it is what applies. So what you have is a position where a person can do and go and apply for bail and the courts will determine whether you're entitled to it. And if they're so entitled, they, they, they deem that you are entitled to it and they decide they will give you bail, as in this particular case, which the, 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 the member prior to me conveniently left out, they gave a compendium of conditions. You mix matters and you breach any one of those conditions, it's right back in prison. Unless, unless the government is prepared, as they, I see they have been doing in previous speakers, show your hands up and say, hey, the roof going to blow off with a, a little tornado wind and people going to break out and we can't depend on that. That's something else. But as far as I'm aware, the law 
continues to guarantee people's rights, and that is what we are about on this side. And we are not saying that everybody who is a murder accused must be roaming around free. Nobody on this side ever said that, or any lawyer that I know of ever submitted that before the courts. It is a matter that they are entitled to apply for bail. It's just that simple. And if it is, according to this express report and the, 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 the Minister of Energy member for Policy in North St. Anne's West is of the view that something is wrong, is it that he is saying that for the length of time that that bill has been, that that law, sorry, has been in place where you could not apply for it, what period is he talking about? Because crime has been spiraling out of control. This is only now, today, only today as a result of court proceedings and a successful challenge, this is the first person who got bail, murder accused, and conditions attached. So what was the cause for the time period that has gone by over the years that caused the spiral in crime? Nobody was being allowed to apply and to come out on, on bail if they were murder accused. So what, what hypocrisy is this? But Mr. Deputy Speaker, on that note, I want to define what is a hypocrite. I want to define what is a hypocrite. You know what hypocrisy and what is a hypocrite? It is a person saying that they will support procurement legislation, and when it is passed, they come and say they got in that legislation. That is hypocrite. Hypocrisy is when you come here and you're talking about Stanley John reports and asking the opposition to act on it when you didn't have the, the goal to come in the house and lay the Stanley John report for everybody to see. That is hypocrisy. And you have a minister of national security come here and shouting, shouting, whoa! He shouted, whoa, it was a war of words. I don't know who he was talking to. The man shout from beginning to end. No, Naparima was not shouting. But Napari member for Naparima was passionate. Members. Members. Again, again, honorable member, address the chair, please. Address the chair. Yes, sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know what hypocrisy is? Hypocrisy is coming to say, don't look at the results. We have a remand court. This is the first time, according to the Minister of National Security, we have a remand court. Hypocrisy is saying that that is on the compound of the prison, but you can't tell us how many people have been convicted. That is hypocrisy. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I know the substantive speaker allowed this hypocrite word to be used. I don't know in this house, yes, Minister of Finance, I know you are a little confused about that, but that was cleared up. Mr. Deputy Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, <laughs> hypocrisy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is when you come here and you throw your arms, your, your arms and your hands up in the air and you basically absolve all responsibility and you throw the police service commission under the bus and the different service commissions. That is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and being a hypocrite, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is when you come here and you're talking about, we're talking about broken promises. Honorable Leader of the Opposition, Member for Separia, spoke about this. You promised 100 municipal officers 100 per corporation, so we should have 1,400. She indicated that only 300 were appointed, according to the PNM's promise, you know. And then the minister comes and says, no, it's 726. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let us define what is hypocrisy. There were 426 municipal officers. A promise was made to take that up to 1,400. They added 300, and that is why they have 726. So hypocrisy is saying that we don't know what we're talking about. When we say you only appoint 300, you only appoint 300. There was 426 already in the system. That is 726. So where is the 1400? We are entitled on this side to raise that. Are we serious about fighting crime or we want to be hypocritical about crime? That is hypocrisy and talking about hypocrites. Now, I know they have an obsession on that side to talk about laying charges. 
and calling people's names on this side. And, and it goes on, and, and even the Minister of National Security, if I could have charged and convict, I would have done it. And that is why they can't solve crime. You have a previous member commissioner of police, sorry, a previous commissioner of police saying that none other than the prime minister was seeking to interfere and influence with his position, an independent position, to Standing take positions. Remember, I will have to appeal this particular one. Again, move on to another point, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are seeking to define hypocrite, but I will move on, please. Please, I can hear. Now, you don't need to answer, I can hear. Proceed to another point. Th thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are a lot more I want to say about that, but hopefully I will get to it. Now, I'm hearing some comments coming from the other side. I, I, I want to make my, my submission here. I, I didn't say anything to it others. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to make my submissions here. If there's a valid objection, stand on the standing orders and I will give way, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, I don't know what hypocrisy is this. No need to reiterate. Thank you. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we talk about statistics, I, I heard some statistics being waved and, and, and uh, as I said, it was a real shouting match by the Minister of National Security. And, but I, I just want to say very quickly, because I'm told I only have 10 minutes um, remaining. Mr. Deputy Speaker, would I be allowed to, to have the time extended to 45 minutes? So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about murders uh, between the period 2020, 2021, 2022. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, there's a reason why I, I chose that. This is in direct answer to the Minister of National Security. So I understand the debate is not about him, but in as much as he has raised it, I want him to go back and look at the, the statistics under him. And what I want to say is that there has been a 50% increase in murders for a similar period, a 94% increase in fraud offenses, a 47% increase in woundings and shootings, 56% increase in kidnappings. I'm talking about 2020, July 2020 coming up, and we are in uh, March 2022. 41% increase in murder of our elderly, at least 97 larcenies of a dwelling house, 1,072 burglaries and break-ins, 20 business places were robbed. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, you didn't hear any decrease. I, you, I don't think anybody mistook what I was saying and heard the word decrease. They were all increases. So I don't know what statistics he's quoting from, but I would suggest that he goes, goes back and, and, and look at his, wherever he's getting his information from. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is in terms of the statistics. Now, I want to say that in 2015, and this is important, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in August 2015, and I, I, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with, with, with your permission, and I want to show again what is hypocrisy. And I want to show the meaning of who is a hypocrite. We had a statement, and these are very important words, you know, I took it seriously, I still do. The yardstick we will use to measure our success in crime fighting is how you feel about your security. I, I, I treat those words very, very, very important. They're very important. Those words were uttered seven years ago, none other by our Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley. Remember, just in your preamble before that, you yes. were saying you will identify who is an hypocrite. So again, I no. needed to retract that statement. Hold yes. on. I needed to retract that statement and move on. I, I retract. Let's know. I, I needed to retract this statement based on what you said prior to the, the statement you made just now. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I said who is a hypocrite, I withdraw that outright. And I needed to redraw the last statement also. Wh which is, I, need, I, I, I will Sabaki, define who is a hypocrite, I, need I withdraw that, Sabaki. Mr. Speaker. I need no assistance. I withdraw the statement, Thank you. Mr. I, I thought I had said, and if I, I, I want to say I'm saying it now, I am defining what is a hypocrite. Please, let's don't go down that road. I have ruled, Naprima, I need no assistant. 
Miss, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I abide by the ruling of the chair, and I withdraw right. that statement. And you proceed. Thank you. Now, and I, I was speaking about the words that were uttered in 2015. What you have now... Sorry? You don't need to repeat anything with regards to it. That's fine, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I take your guidance. I'm moving along. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would like to have my full time, please. Now, if this, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is the Prime Minister's, uh, and this is the head of the National Security Council, this is the head of the government, this motion is about the government, if that is the government's own yardstick, they can't take that from anywhere else. This is coming from the top, and that is the government's yardstick. Then what are we faced with later? That was in August of 2015. I am talking about now, when we think about what is going on now, what are the statements that we are hearing now, Mr. Deputy Speaker? And this is where I am saying that you have a position being taken where none other than the Minister of National Security taking the position when called out by one Mr. Fazir Mohammed, who is a respected journalist, a sports commentator, a sports analyst, and a morning show program host. And this is what he had to say on the failure to keep people safe. Minister Hines, in his, I must say, characteristic, brazen, bold, and arrogant manner, this is what he said. No, my duty is not to ensure that people feel safe and secure. So you have a prime minister saying what is the yardstick. And many years later, now almost seven years later, you have the minister saying something different. Honorable member. Yes, please. Again, we spoke about and a decision was made on that statement that was made some time ago by the honorable prime minister. And I don't want it reference to anything based on the topic that you're on of hypocrisy. And that I'm not going to get up on my legs again to talk about that particular aspect. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, respectfully, you made me withdraw the hypocrisy already. So I'm just moving on with the debate. But you are making reference on the same particular individual yes. as you go along. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am showing that if we are serious about fighting crime, this motion is about government. How can you have the head of the government, the head of the National Security Council, saying one thing as being the approach or the standard, the yardstick by which we must look at crime, and then years later, when crime is spiraling out of control, suddenly we have a different standard. That's all I'm saying. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Police Service Commission, how much, how, many, how much time do I have again, Mr. Deputy Speaker? Just about three minutes. Now, four minutes, sorry, four minutes. Four minutes. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about Police Service Commission a little bit. And I don't have much time. I, I really wanted to touch on um, human trafficking, but I, I will maybe in another debate. For the purposes of this debate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I want to say that when we look at the Police Service Commission, I want to briefly touch on the implication of not having installed a substantive commission of police, without which, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, the potential for a further deterioration in the crime situation in this country exists. That is what we are dealing with here. So I don't want to go into debate on the Police Service Commission itself and how it was dismantled and all that went wrong, but I want to say that where the country has seen, we are talking about crime, the, the, the elements in this country are not only law-abiding, they are the criminal elements as well. And so where they see that such an interference, or however they perceive it, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they see something taking place which led to the dismantling of the substantive commission of police. What signal are we sending to the criminal elements? And I heard the previous member talk about consequences. The consequences of what has happened between July or August 2021 to now, this is what we are reaping here now, the consequences of those actions which led to the total dismantling of a police service commission, the removal of a substantive commission of police, and this is what we have to deal with now. Numbers that we have no pleasure in reciting in this chamber, but numbers which are real and which we have to grapple with. 
So I want to say that <coughs> it, in effect, leads to a headless, member for Naparima has often said rudderless, police service. And this is important because we have just witnessed one of the darkest episodes in this country's history that has resulted in where we are today. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, 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 it, it is unfortunate that I don't have time to get into it. I want to say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as, as I seek to conclude, that I categorically support the motion that Member of Parliament for Naparima has brought before this House in the interest of the people of this country. Mr. Deputy Speaker, having listened to him pilot this motion, I, member for Shaguanas West, I am overwhelmingly convinced that the Minister of National Security must do the right thing. And we are talking about, under the motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are talking about a, a, a motion to resolve that this House reprimand this government for its failure to effectively prevent the surge in criminal activity in this country. And I am saying that the ultimate way to reprimand this government is to have the Minister of National Security resign or fired, and this government call an immediate election, because that is the ultimate re reprimand that will satisfy this, this situation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, if we are talking about the rights and the interests of the people, we must abide and rule by the law of the people, by the rights of the people, by the wishes of the people. I thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Excuse honourable member, please. Right. Thank you. I recognise the member. I recognise the member for La Hoketa Talparo, and you have 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. No. Again, I... um, honourable members, first of all, I would not entertain any, well, first of all, no disruptions are to be entertained. And worse yet, if you are not sitting in your particular parli parliamentary seat. Right? So please, resident, please, members. Go ahead, member. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I join this debate on this motion to express my absolute disagreement with the contents of this motion and to say that we will demonstrate during the course of this debate the government's continued vigor and commitment to create a safe space for all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the government views with concern the crime levels in Trinidad and Tobago, and we take careful note of the number of young persons who in one way or another have become involved in criminal conduct. Mr. Deputy Speaker, crime inflicts hurt and distress on all our citizens, and this government will continue to implement preventative measures and bring about the required legislation to the Parliament to combat the scourge of gang activity, related illegal activity involving drugs, robbery, murder, and other serious crimes. This work is a whole of government approach, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is approach involving the work of several ministries, including National Security, the Attorney General in Legal Affairs, the Ministry of Education, Youth Development and National Service, Social Development and Family Services, Child and Gender Affairs, Community Development and Sport, and even the Ministry of Agriculture, to name a few. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in recognition of that fact, we all as citizens have a role to play in crime prevention. It is not only the role of the government. It is not only the role of government MPs, but it will be interesting for the members opposite to note 
that it also involves the members of the opposition. All responsible citizens of Trinidad and Tobago should do their part in terms of crime prevention, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This is not about scoring political, cheap political points. The enemy here, the enemy does not reside within these walls. The enemy in this matter involves the criminal elements within the society. And I dare say, I would hope that we do not have any of those elements within the confines of these walls. The Prime Minister, Madam Speaker, Ma Mr. Deputy Speaker, in keeping with good governance and out of concern for over 500,000 young people, established the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. And in speaking on this motion that seeks to suggest as the mover of the motion did, that the government is not proactive in putting measures in place to prevent criminal behavior, and in suggesting that the government is only focused on preventative measures, it is my intention during my contribution to demonstrate the whole of government approach, and in particular, the work that has been conducted by the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service with regards to treating with the development of our young people. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this ministry, a new ministry as established by the Prime Minister, is charged with developing and implementing programs and activities towards the holistic development of our young people, creating an environment and creating opportunities to allow them to realize their fullest potential and to live a life away from criminal behavior, to become productive members of society and contributing to our sustainable development, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As part of this whole of government approach, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service will implement the following specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely programs. That is a smart term used by the mover of the motion. We have kicked off works for the refurbishment of the St. Michael's School for Boys, which will cater for children in need of supervision or otherwise chins or who are wards of the state and will offer services focused on restorative justice, which with the emphasis on rehabilitation of young offenders, offering them an opportunity to take responsibility for their actions, and at the same time, making available training in areas of technical vocational learning, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In addition, training in academics and preparing them for CSEC examinations. While this facility will focus on rehabilitation of young men, we will undertake, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to introduce a similar facility for young women in the not too distant future. That is your proactive government at work, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in keeping with our trust towards youth development, we will reintroduce the youth camps throughout Trinidad and Tobago. That is the youth apprenticeship and development centers. And these centers are geared towards residential learning in technical and vocational disciplines. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we will, in short order, refurbish and reintroduce the Chatham Youth Camp in Point 14. It is the government's intention to re reintroduce and develop the Presto Presto Youth Camp in Freeport. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the public will be delighted to know that the El Dorado Camp for Girls at will be reintroduced very soon. It is also the government's intention to repurpose the Shagaramas Convention Center as a youth development and apprenticeship center. We will construct in the, in, we will, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, I'm still flabbergasted as how Kuva Sao became the flagship speaker for the UNC. Mr. 
I may not, I may not have agreed with everything that Shogonis West said, but certainly that might be a choice that the opposition leader should consider. We will construct a flagship facility at Wallafield that will be a co-ed residential facility and accommodate both age categories 15 to 18 and 19 to 25, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, earlier this week, I met with the Chief Secretary and members of the Executive Council of the THA to discuss the construction of a new youth camp at Mount St. George in Tobago. That is development, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In addition, in addition, we will as well expand our suite of non-residential youth development centers, which will offer similar technical vocational programs at the community level. We now have centers at California, St. James, Los Bajo, Malik, Basilos Street, and Laventil, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In addition to these centers that cater and are intended to provide safe spaces for our young people and for the development of our young people, the government will modernize the existing facilities and in addition, construct 14 new facilities at various locations throughout Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We will as well collaborate with the following agencies to facilitate training and development of our young people. YTEP, NESC, UTT, MIC, Kariri, the University of the West Indies, Youth Business Trinidad and Tobago, GNU of the UN, LSA, the Tobago House of Assembly, the National Youth Council, the Children's Authority, NEDCO, the Agricultural Development Bank, the On the Job Training Program, to name a few, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In keeping with this government's trust, the government appointed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, a policy advisory committee to develop a new curriculum and management model for our youth training and apprenticeship centers. And all of these agencies, Mr. Deputy Speaker, will of course contribute to the development of our young people. In disagreeing with this motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we continue to introduce robust programs for the development of our young people, all 500,000 of them, no matter where they are in Trinidad and Tobago, be it Laventil, Morva, Labre, Point Fortin, Separia, Kuva, Shaguanas, Barakpur, it does not matter. We are here to represent all of the young people of this country. And so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the motion speaks about not taking proactive action. This government will introduce agriculture as a key career path for our young people. In so doing, we recently launched the Youth Agricultural Homestead Program. It is a program that will allow our young people with the interest in agriculture to access training and to access land to become 21st century agro-entrepreneurs. Every time the UNC hears about land, they get very antsy and start to make all sorts of spurious allegations. I want to tell them, if you have allegations to make, take it to the police if you have facts. Other than that, take it to the Lord in prayer. The Youth Agricultural Homesteads Program, Mr. Deputy Speaker, will introduce 200 trained agro-professionals to our improved agricultural sector annually over the next three years. I'm sure that's welcome news for the member for Coover South. In addition to these programs, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have the national service programs. Cabinet has appointed a committee chaired by Dr. Ruby Allen to develop a comprehensive national voluntary, voluntary national service program. It will be, I'm certain, good news to Trinidad and Tobago to learn that the government has decided to repurpose the former Petrochin facility at Beach Camp in Palo Seco as a modern state-of-the-art national service complex, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This service complex 
will be operated by the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service in conjunction with the military through the Specialized Youth Services Program to rehabilitate and to empower our young people through positive behavior change systems while increasing their academic and vocational qualifications with an introduction to entrepreneurial development as a component. We will also refurbish the Old Teachers College at Mausika as another national service complex, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Programs such as MyLat, MyPAT, and CCC, which were mentioned by the move of the motion, will form part of the programming at these facilities and with the full involvement of the military. These, contrary to the statement made by the move of the motion, Mr. Deputy Speaker, these programs will be expanded and each complex will house in excess of 500 cadets, Mr. Deputy Speaker, both male and female. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have also expanded the capacity of our transition homes to enable our young people leaving community residences when they attain the age of 18 years to transition to adulthood in an, in an enabling environment with the necessary support that facilitates their growth and development and prepares them for independent living. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have decided, we have decided to expand the capacity of the transition home at St. Madeline and to triple the intake at that home for boys in St. Madeline. We do not discriminate. Wherever these facilities exist throughout Trinidad and Tobago, the government will develop and expand them to the benefit of all our young people throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the government has expanded the capacity at the Josephine Shaw Transition Home in Port of Spain for young women. We will soon commission this new facility at that location. I visited that facility only last week and the contractor will soon hand over that facility to the government. All of this as a whole of government approach designed to offer alternatives to young people and steer them away from a life of crime, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We will as well repurpose buildings at Sevilla in Coover to accommodate a transition home for women. I am certain that the member of parliament for that district will be pleased to know that the government will as well pay close attention to the development of our young people in that district. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that what I have described in my contribution constitute just a fraction of the work that the government is committed to doing throughout all of the ministries and departments falling under our purview. And what I'm outlining is just the work of the Youth Development Ministry. Some of the other programs I can share, Mr. Deputy Speaker, would be the Youth Business Hubs, a program designed to encourage micro-entrepreneurship. And therefore, in our visit to Tobago earlier this week, we were able to view some of the micro-entrepreneurship centers established by the Tobago House of Assembly in Tobago. And I dare say, Mr. S Deputy Speaker, we are quite impressed by what we saw. I met several young people who have ventured into business. One young man, just 21 year years old, operating a very successful business, a lot of other entrepreneurs. And our youth business hub, as mentioned in the budget by the Minister of Finance, will certainly take the model of a micro-entrepreneurship center as exists in our sister isle in Tobago. You would be pleased to know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that in addition to that development, the government will as well establish youth business parks to encourage our young people to get involved with areas of agro-processing and light manufacturing. And that program is uh, intended to be ruled out during this fiscal year. In addition, you would know that we already launched the Youth Agro Incentive Grants, and that program has been well and oversubscribed by young people who wish to get involved in agriculture. I can tell you that for the YAP program that we launched on the 1st of March, applications closed yesterday, and we have received approximately 12 
500 applications from young people desirous of expanding their agricultural pursuits. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in addition, we will, in collaboration with Kariri and the Ministry of Planning and Development, establish a youth business incubator to assist those young persons who would have established their business and require assistance in making sure that it is a success. And that work will be done by NEDCO that falls under the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. You know that we have a very successful National Youth Awards Program and we'll continue in our recognition of our, our outstanding youths because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have so many examples in this country of young people who are passionate, educated, bright, and promising, and who will serve as flag bearers and as leaders in the community for those other young people who need that light to follow. And the government is intent on nurturing that talent and expressing and showcasing that talent throughout the country and the region, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, in addition, several mentorship programs are being rolled out at our non-residential youth development centers. I wish to indicate that one program that we are very proud of is the Amplify program, which is a program in music production and life skills. So many of our young people, I refer to the talent that exists among, among our young people. So many of our young people have enrolled in this program and in partnership with corporate Trinidad and Tobago, we expect that the successes that come from this program will the uptake in the private sector from a training program like this will be quite significant. An all set program. We hear the complaint all the time from people going into communities, from members of parliament, from councillors at the local government level, of the many young people, in particular young men, so to speak, on the blocks within various communities with, with not attending to their own and personal development. And therefore, the government has launched a program all set, which is an alternative learning and life skill enhancement training program. And in conjunction uh, with NESC, the government will offer a program in, in heavy equipment operations. I was so pleased to visit the execution of this program and see a lot of young men who traditionally may not have been involved in any productive activity, taking the time off to equip themselves and to skill themselves in heavy equipment operations. And so, so Madam Speaker, these young people now have hope. They could easily have listened to members of the opposition that the sky has fallen in on Chicken Licking's head and all is at distress in Trinidad and Tobago. But with a government that is responsible and led by a responsible prime minister and a cabinet that cares about the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we are determined to roll out programs where they have hope, where they have access, and where they could work towards their overall and holistic development. In addition, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have introduced programs in coding, mobile application development, and web design. And we do this in conjunction with the MIC, moving towards a technology-driven society because we must keep in tune with international developments. Our young people, you know, we had, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Intech Park, which was a facility designed to make Trinidad and Tobago the leading technologically driven economy this part of the Western Hemisphere. And as time would have it, the UNC came into government. And that program, of course, like many others, suffered at the sword of the UNC. 
Madam Speaker, the common word used in this debate, somebody tried to give us a definition for it earlier on, and they seem to like the word. But how can you, I'm not even going to mention it, how can you come to this parliament with a motion that suggests that this government is doing nothing about crime prevention? When you think crime prevention is only the policing, you shut down all the youth camps when you had the opportunity. You closed, you closed NESC in Point Fortin and in Labre and in Palo Seco. You shut down opportunities for the training and development of our young people and therefore leaving them without that opportunity. What did you expect? We are now reaping the harvest of your incompetence. How can you come to this parliament and talk about crime prevention when the government, the Patrick Manning-led administration, secured custom-built OPVs to protect our port, to protect our borders, to, to prevent the gun running, to prevent the cocaine coming and the guns that come with it, and to secure our borders, and immediately you came to office, you scrapped the project. And then when the government, this government, entered into an arrangement with the Australian government to make sure that we could provide vessels to patrol the borders, you went and you wrote to the AG in Australia, trying to sabotage the efforts of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And so when we say that there's a level of hypocrisy coming from certain quarters, we know what we are talking about. When we say, Madam Speaker, when we say that there's a lack of patriotism on the other side, we know what we are talking about. At every turn, you seek to paint Trinidad and Tobago in a way and in a manner as though you are not a citizen yourself. Any self-respecting citizen will be proud to showcase their country as a place where you want to invite every other citizen from outside of this country. Yet, you feel pride, you take pride in painting your country as a place where nobody should come. You want crime on the front pages. You want to say to the world that Trinidad is a place riddled with crime. And then you come here and you refuse to support legislation designed to improve our circumstances. We are not asleep. The citizens are not asleep and they pay close attention. The member for Separia woke up today. And it is not the norm for us to have the benefit of a company. But what, what happened, Madam Speaker, is in that 2010, the advisors of the UNC told them that crime was a hot topic, that tall buildings was a hot topic, and that property tax was a hot topic. So they held on to that as their campaign strategy, and somehow they ended up in government. Having been placed back where they belong in opposition, for not one term but two, one after the next, it appears that they have hired the same consultant again. So every time they come to this parliament, it's crime, it's crime, it's crime. It's property tax, it's property tax, it's property tax. Well, they don't have no buildings to talk about. And the point is, Madam Speaker, that no matter what they do, the people of Trinidad and Tobago will not forget the way you govern Trinidad and Tobago between 2010 and 2015. And I dare say, I dare say, you will not in any time soon see the corridors of power in this country again. Our focus, Madam Speaker, is on the, on the development of all our people. 
but we'll place particular focus on the development of our young people. Young people are affected by violent crimes, yes, some as victims, and I dare say some as perpetrators. But to combat the effects of crime and what it inflicts on the economic and social structures of our society, the government, through a dynamic, driven, and capable team of competent professionals across ministries and led by the most experienced member of this house, the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, has strategically implemented and continues to implement specific preventative programs utilizing a whole of government approach, as I said earlier, Madam Speaker, to rehabilitate and to redirect our young people away from a life of crime, gangs, and drugs, and to transform them into productive and positive members of our society. We will continue to implement programs in conjunction with the military through our specialized youth services programs as we steer the course in addressing the rise or the rise in crime perpetrated by some of our young men and women. As well, we will deal with, in a frontal way, the question of unemployment and the lack of patriotism displayed by some of our young people. But I dare say, Madam Speaker, that the vast majority of our young people, the vast majority of our citizens are law-abiding and God-fearing people. And we will continue to raise with pride the flag of Trinidad and Tobago. We will continue to sing with pride that every creed and race finds an equal place in this country. We will not discriminate and we will govern to the benefit of all our citizens. I thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Tabor, Keith. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to join in this very important debate as the opposition brings in focus the safety and security of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I would firstly like to thank the member for Naparima for his foresight in bringing a motion that deals with a very critical matter that is facing the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And, and Madam Speaker, I have written many speeches in my lifetime, many, many speeches. And I just listened to my colleague from La Hokita, Tal Paru. And in his contribution here today to this motion, I think that's, that particular speech was misplaced because as I listened, that sounded more like a campaign speech than a response to this motion here today. And if I have my math correct, Madam Speaker, if I have my math correct, we are a few years away from a general election. So one could only infer what the member may be campaigning for here today with that speech. Because Madam Speaker, as a response to this motion, there were a lot of what we will do, what we intend to do. And this motion is meant to bring into focus what has not been done to create the situation that we are facing here today, Madam Speaker. And so as I say, while we appreciate the sentiments, and we appreciate the patriotism, and we appreciate the appeal, it wasn't a speech for here today on this platform, Madam Speaker. But I want to firstly deal with the Minister of National Security, because as we prepared for this debate, knowing the seriousness, knowing the sentiments that the people of Trinidad and Tobago have been expressing time and time again about the fact that they do not feel safe in their country, in their homes at any point in time, the Minister of National Security has failed on every occasion when he has gotten a chance to report to the people of this nation to make any sense here today. Madam Speaker, that Pre what that presentation by the Minister of National Security in response to the member for Naparima, he was unprepared, he was unimpressive, Madam Speaker, and I, and I could feel, I could feel the pain of the member for Port of Spain North 
St. Anne's West when he had to try to come back here and course correct for the minister just before him. I mean, Madam Speaker, people, as the member for La Hoketa, Talpara rightfully said, people are looking on. This is televised. It is on YouTube. You could clip it. You could play it over. And that is how you come to defend not just your record, but the government's record. And Madam Speaker, that presentation today showed all of us in this house exactly why we are in the problem that we are in today. Because crime is a serious problem. And it is a problem that has so many elements to it, but it requires serious solutions. And most importantly, it requires a serious person at the helm, and we do not have that here today. And so, Madam Speaker, the minister in his presentation spoke, could not address what the member for Naparima said about the absence of data and the requirement of having proper data for proper policy making. And I know that because when you, when you try to go through all of the old talk and the noise that you were hearing, m the minister kept circling back to legislation and that they are bringing legislation and they have to keep the criminals in mind when you bring in legislation. And then he went on to put it as usual political picker. But Madam Speaker, I just sit there and think, but the common sense has to be very absent from that side. Which criminal, Madam Speaker, sits down and says, you know what? That is against the law, so I cannot do it. That is the definition of a criminal that they are breaking the law, so you feel they care what legislation we pass here and when we pass it and how we pass it, they don't care, right? And so that is why when the, min the Minister of Energy had to come to try to save face, because I am sure the minister recognized the egg on the government's face after their first responder, to say, well, it is about consequences. It is about the con uh, that there not being consequences for action and for criminal activity. He is very correct. The problem is the minister charged with the responsibility for security didn't know that basic point. They, he did not understand that criminals don't care about laws. They don't. And so, <laughs> Madam Speaker, to come here and to say, because after the minister of national security spoke, it appeared to me that the chief policy of the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago as they are today to treat with crime and criminality is on one hand to, fight, to talk about a legislative aim, which we know has failed, and on the other hand, to blame everything else under the sun. And so when we talk about, as I heard the member for La Hokita Talparo come, come in to talk about a whole of government approach and the need, and the, and the need for other elements to take place and crime prevention, you are now dealing with the fact that their main responder, the person with the responsibility for national security, dismissed all of that. Dismissed all of that outright in his presentation. And anybody who, anybody who had the stomach to listen for the entire 45 minutes could tell, could tell that it was, there was just no forethought, no thought about the citizens, what they would be listening to. I mean, imagine in talking about resourcing the police service and that in stating that his responsibility as minister is to provi provide resources to the TTPS and that, the, and that they, are, they are going to ensure that they are well resourced. The minister went on to congratulate the TTPS in the same speech that he tried to throw the TTPS under the bus by saying they are responsible for enforcement, so if you are seeing a problem, it's the TTPS. But he went on to congratulate the TTPS for work done. So you see in the confusion. But the fact is, if you spoke to members of the TTPS minister, they don't want your congratulations. They want their wage negotiations, right? So when you come and you say that that is their job, that is the work that they are doing, well, don't pay them from 2013 salaries that you recognize it as 2022, and they also have lives, and therefore, stop with the congratulations, start to mind your business as the Minister of National Security, and figure out what it is you really ought to be doing. Now, my favorite part of the Minister of National Security's speech today, his response today, was when he congratulated the young Miss Critchlow 
from his constituency who received the open scholarship. And I want to join in that congratulations here today because I am a firm believer that education is not only the key for individuals, but a well-educated society, a society that sees an investment in education that is targeted and sensible, we will see a reduction in crime over time. And so I join in that Congress. And then, but, <laughs> and this is where I realize that Minister of National Security, I could put my head on a block, absolutely doesn't know what is going on. Yeah. I beg to move that this house to now adjourn to a date to be fixed. Nice stuff. So, honorable members, as you know, Wednesday the 30th day of March 2022, our country will celebrate Spiritual Shouter Baptist Liberation Day. Therefore, before I put the question on the adjournment to the House, I shall invite members to bring their greetings. On behalf of the government. Member Fala Hawketa Talparo. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. As I join with my colleagues on behalf of the government bench, and as a practicing spiritual Baptist myself, I wish to extend to all members of the faith who have over time been able to demonstrate a level of pride and determination in what our forefathers and those who came before us would have had to endure at the hands of the then legislature. And to know that today, we as a people can proudly join with other members of society and freely practice the religion of the spiritual Shouta Baptist. Madam Speaker, not too long ago, we lost to COVID, the leader of the spiritual Baptist faith in Trinidad and Tobago, Patriarch Archbishop Stephen Julian. And I should take the opportunity at this time to express sincere condolences to the spiritual Baptist community on the passing of the Patriarch of the spiritual Baptist faith. And let me say, that as the faith develops, it is very, is a welcome support that the government has decided to support the spiritual Baptist faith in the construction of a modern cathedral for members of the faith at Coover in the vicinity of the Atobolden Stadium. Construction of this facility has already commenced, and we look forward to being able to commission that place of worship in the not too distant future. On Wednesday, members of the faith from throughout Trinidad and Tobago, and many throughout the diaspora in the Caribbean and North America and Europe will join with Spiritual Baptists in Trinidad and Tobago to celebrate the repeal of the prohibition order that prevented spiritual Baptists from freely conducting their worship in Trinidad and Tobago. And so, on Wednesday, as we celebrate this holiday, we wish to share the experiences, the cultural experience, and the traditions of worship with all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and various locations throughout Trinidad and Tobago will have these celebrations in commemoration of this day. Once again, on behalf of the government, on behalf of the Prime Minister and all members of the government bench, I wish all members of the Spiritual Baptist community a very holy and happy Spiritual Baptist Liberation Day. Thank you, Madam.
Member from Aruga, Tableland. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, as a practicing member of the Spiritual Baptist faith, I take great honor in bringing greetings to the community, the Baptist community, on behalf of the opposition bench, on behalf of my esteemed political leader, the Honorable Ms. Kamala Kasabi Sessa, the member for Saparia. Madam Speaker, I would like to raise Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 18 which shows us rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. On Wednesday the 30th of March, 2022, we will be commemorating the Spiritual Baptist Liberation Day and, the sem and 71 years since the repeal of the Prohibition Ordinance. Towards this observance, we echo sentiments of gratitude to the Baptist community for their contributions to the melting pot we call Trinidad and Tobago. We uplift their resilience amidst challenges, faced oppressions encountered, and disrespect endured, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, their response to the prohibition was one of hope. These unprecedented times have called upon each one of us to have just that, hope. The coronavirus pandemic may be coming to an end by God's grace, but the lesson we have learned as a community, as the nation of Trinidad and Tobago, will forever be with us. Let us look to the exemplary community for guidance and strength. For this community was steadfast in their way forward, Madam Speaker, never giving up, always looking forward and seeking God throughout trying times. Madam Speaker, with these few words, I would like to end with one of my favorite songs, a line from it, Madam Speaker. I saw the lighthouse shining in glory. I saw the lighthouse. Amen. Jesus is the lighthouse, Madam Speaker. And just like the Baptist community practice resilience in all things, I wish the community of Trinidad and Tobago and the spiritual Baptist community come Wednesday that when we celebrate in all different sections of Trinidad and Tobago, that we keep on fighting and we keep on looking to the hills from whence come our health and strength. I thank you. Honorable members, I would also like to extend greetings to the spiritual shelter Baptist community as they prepare to celebrate Spiritual Shorter Baptist Liberation Day. Honorable members may recall that Trinidad and Tobago is the only country in the world to celebrate this day by way of a public holiday. This is because the Spiritual Shorter Baptist faith is indigenous to Trinidad and Tobago. This day marks the 1951 repeal of the Shorter Prohibition Ordinance of 1917 which denied members of this faith the freedom of worship and the dignified enjoyment of their religion. Honorable members, as we glance across the globe, we see that freedom cannot be an unfettered license, but must be married with responsibility, tolerance, fairness, and inclusiveness, all of which are important elements of democracy. Recent world events have demonstrated that we must never be complacent with the existence of democracy. Democracy must not be taken for granted, and we must therefore jealously safeguard responsibility, tolerance, fairness, and inclusiveness. The history behind the spiritual Baptist faith serves as a reminder to all members and citizens of the importance of protecting the fundamental rights and freedom of all citizens as enshrined in our Constitution. Honorable members, may the bells of freedom, justice, tolerance, inclusiveness, peace and love continue to ring out loudly and may these principles continue to order our steps as a nation. I therefore take this opportunity on behalf of the Parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to extend best wishes 
to the spiritual Shouter Baptist community. Honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to a date to be fixed. All in favor say aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to a date to be fixed.